Welcome to everyone. Uh, we'd like to get started if we could, if you could all grab your seats and uh, get ready to get going. Um, thank you all for coming out this evening. This is a joint meeting with the Falls Church City Council and School Board to talk about our George Mason High School campus site planning. So it's good to see everyone back together again. I know it's, we've had a bit of a, a break and it's good that everyone's back here to get together. Um, Mr. Casillo, do you have anything you wanna say before we get started? Just glad everybody could uh, come out on this uh, beautiful August night and uh, look forward to uh, hearing our presentations and finding a way forward. Thanks. Sounds good. Mr. Shields, are you going to lead off with the uh, staff portion of this agenda? Uh, um, yes, if I could, and, and I'm sure Dr. Jones will, will jump in as well. If I could just go through a couple of points on the agenda and uh, talk about what are what we think are the goals and purpose of this meeting, what we'd like to come away from this meeting with. Um, in short, what I think this is is a dis uh, this meeting is, is going to be lighter on presentations than what we've had in the past on this, and hopefully more in the realm of discussion and agreement or, or working towards agreement on how we'll work together um, on, on this process going forward. Um, in summary, uh, we've concluded the P3 process, and so now we're really more in a traditional footing of two parallel tracks for planning for the campus. We have the school planning effort, we have our uh, master planning effort for the commercial uh, aspects of this project. We're both used to those processes, we know what they look like, and what we need to do in this process is just make sure that those two parallel tracks are constantly informing each other so that uh, well-informed uh, decisions can be made by you um, by the city council and by the school board with, good, with a good fact base and with lots of community input. So in terms of, of tonight's agenda, we'd like to start off with a little bit of an outsider's perspective. Uh, we've brought in um, some guests that I'll introduce in just a moment who will share some experiences um, that other localities have gone through uh, with similar projects, similar complexity. Um, uh, and so we'll talk about um, how they framed up their decision-making process and what we could learn from that. Uh, we'd like to talk about um, the roadmap ahead and what we really think for tonight's discussion is is to identify what are some of the key foundational questions that need to be answered as we go down these two parallel tracks. Um, and uh, we have a, you know, the school tract and, and the city tract. We'll, we'll talk about what, what some of those major questions are. We want you all to put your questions on the table um, and, and um, identify the, the big ones in a timeline and a process for answering them. Uh, we'd like to circle back and just do a, a, a fairly quick summary of what we think we've learned to date. That also is a discussion. Uh, we'll put some things out there that we think we've learned um, and make sure that's, that's a pretty decent um, starting of a fact base, a shared fact base that we all agree with as we go forward. And then lastly, uh, just some uh, looking ahead, um, where we go from here, and I think one thing, a, a concrete step we'd like to uh, have a discussion about is four meetings as we go forward, how frequently we need to meet, and what would be regular order for those meetings of the two bodies. Uh, one thing we've we've seen in the past is sometimes just a getting a date where we can get together takes a, uh, a fair amount of energy and time. I want to see if we can regularize that. So does that sound like a, a good agenda for tonight and, and what people are, are thinking we, will, we would try to accomplish? Okay. Dr. Jones, any, uh, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Well, so from an outsider's perspective, we, uh, we have guests from uh, Link Strategic Partners, and we've had a couple of conversations with them. And uh, one thing I'll just to, uh, say up front, they do help localities um, with this type of a process. Um, we have not put them under retainer. Uh, we have had a, an agreement just to prepare for this meeting, but uh, we do not have an agreement to go forward uh, with them in the future, but that could be a, a decision point uh, uh, for the two bodies as to whether they would want to have uh, some help like this as we go forward. Really, the purpose of tonight with uh, Link Strategic Partners is to give us some perspective of how these processes have worked in other jurisdictions. And um, so let me introduce Michael Aiken. 
uh, principal with uh, Link strategic, strategic Partners, and maybe you could introduce your team. Absolutely. And uh, no, if yeah. you could, maybe if you could come here and be right next to Tim, Absolutely. that might be the easiest way to do it. I want to give you my back so just yeah. I'm fine. How are you? We just want to do the choreography. No worries. All that. Happy to have all that. No worries. My name is Mike Link, and I run a firm called Link Strategic Partners. Do you need me to use your mic? Yes, we do, because we are taping this meeting. Great. And. Uh, this is exciting. The handheld mic. <laughs> We're good. Uh, my name is Michael Aiken. I run a firm called Link Strategic Partners. We're based just up the street in Washington, D.C., but we do work around the country. We're a stakeholder engagement firm. We specialize in really complex planning processes and figuring out how to get community engagement authentically reflected in those processes and then help boards and bodies make decisions through them. We've done this around the country. Um, I don't think I'm here tonight to, to give you a pitch on our firm. More than that, we were asked uh, about two weeks ago to just take a look at where we are in this process and see if there were any parallels from what we've seen in other cities around the country and if there were anything that jumped out to us as an outsider. So let me say from the very beginning that you all are the experts in this. You're the experts in this community in this process. You've lived it and breathed it for many, many years. I'm basing our perspective on a couple meetings and about 700 pages of past plans that I've read over the last week. So I want to give you that caveat. If there's anything that I'm throwing out there that isn't right or doesn't mesh with what you believe about this process, push back. No offense taken. You're the experts on this. Um, let me introduce a couple of my colleagues here with me. We have Sherry Krakowski in the back. Sherry is the head of all of our real estate planning work. She does real estate development work around the country and has done a lot of public-private partnerships involving educational uh, providers. So thought she would be helpful to talk through some of this. And on my left is Timothy Wisniewski. He's our director of strategic initiatives and is running a very similar process right now in Dalton, Georgia, where the town is seeking a grand partnership that would put the school at the middle of an economic revitalization of the carpet capital of the world. If you didn't know that was Dalton, they are the carpet capital of the world and we're, we're having a really good time down there with them. So what I wanted to do pretty briefly is go through a couple projects that may be instructive. We can move through that. A um, couple projects that might be instructive, one local one, or two local ones and one national one. The, the main thing from our perspective, and I don't know if this generally makes people feel better or worse, is that the situation you're in is not unique. It's hard, it's complex, and it's probably going to get messier before it gets cleaner, but it's not unique, right? There are lots of cities and towns and school systems that are struggling with how to finance a school, how does that work with economic development, are these doing jointly or not? And, and just up the road, we're doing a lot of work right now with Arlington Public Schools. How many people are familiar with the Wilson School Project? Anyone followed this at all? You go to the next slide. It's a really interesting one. It's the old Wilson School site right across from the Roslyn Metro. It's a two and a half acre site. And as you all know, Arlington is out of, out of room. They've grown at 19% in terms of school population over the last five years. So they needed to get really creative on where they put schools. This is a really interesting example of how they did a really constrained development in the middle of economic development. Downtown Roslyn's a pretty dense place. So the Wilson School, Sherry, is how many stories? five-story building with 750 kids, 775. So building a completely urban upscale, and by upscale I mean high density, not upscale luxury, upscale in terms of they've upzoned the site to do a five-story building for 775 kids. There are outdoor areas that are tiered on kind of every level of the project, which are really interesting. There's very limited parking on this because of their proximity to the metro and some adjacent parking. There are no athletic facilities on the site. Those are all handled off-site through other schools or rec departments. What's interesting about this one is if anyone would have asked this community if they would have supported a school like this, um, the answer would have been a resounding no. In fact, it's been tested before. I know some people who work in planning here have been part of this process. What happened this time is, number one, Arlington was out of land, and number two, they ran an international design competition where they asked architects to come in and present their model for a school. They got three different designs, three different building kind of configurations. The architect that ended up winning this is Big Architects. If anyone's in the architecture space, they're the biggest name in architecture right now. They're doing the um, specific Smithsonian's master plan, they're building stadiums, they're doing most of downtown Manhattan. They're the biggest name in architecture right now, and they didn't have a school in their portfolio, and they decided they wanted to do that, and they thought the challenge of a two and a half acre site and 800 kids was, was something they, they would take some pride in. So we ran a design competition with the community to say, there are lots of different models, traditional, upscale, downscale, all different types of models, which one do you like? And over about a six month period, is that right, Sherry? But a six month period, lots of community meetings, in this case, led by the architects. We let each architecture team 
team run their own design process as part of an overall engagement process. And what that looked like is people would come into a gym and each architect would have a different station set up and they were free to engage however they felt best. And out of that whole process, this design won and the building is currently under construction and, and will be open soon. What got really interesting, and I don't want to get us off track here, but what got really interesting about the Wilson project is where this almost fell apart at the 11th hour had nothing to do with it being a high rise. It had everything to do with parental fears that five stories would be five stories worth of stairwells that kids could get bullied in, like a legitimate big town hall meetings about what does this mean when we have five stories of stacked closed space. And the architect said that's, that's a really interesting point. We hadn't considered it. Let's consider that a design challenge. So what they did was they moved all of the stairwells to the exterior of the building and covered them in glass. So now you don't have closed stairwells. You have open stairwells and add closed circuit TV and suddenly your security concerns become a little bit easier. It's just an interesting way to say constrained urban environment, lots of adjacent economic development, and they put a school in the middle of it that met the need for that community. This school might not make the need of every community, but it did this one. And the way Arlington, um, we've worked with them quite a bit to put together a decision-making pathway. What was getting really difficult, especially when things were getting very challenging, um, was who was making what decision when. And so we came up with a pretty aggressive feedback loop that clearly laid out where the school board plays a role, where the staff plays a role, where the community plays a role, where it comes back to the staff, where community feedback is integrated, staff makes a recommendation, then it goes back to the community, then finally the school board makes a decision. So this was after years of not having a feedback loop, this was developed to say who's doing what, when, and where. In this case, the school got to make the decision. There wasn't kind of a, a, a city or county body also weighing in on this one. This was a school-based decision, so it's a little bit more of a simple model than you would have with a, a, a joint body, but it was a very aggressive model that, that they're now using for all of their engagement. Sherry, is there anything else on that project? The only other thing I would say that I think is important, Michael covered all the development issues very well, thank you for that, but I think one thing that was key in this process was that the role of the community in making that choice, because when the process started, because of its location, and it was initially envisioned as a neighborhood school, there was you know, mass sort of pushback on that because of people's concerns that they wanted the more traditional model for their, for their middle school students, and they didn't want them going to an urban school, and they didn't want them across the street from the, from, from the metro. Um, but, the, but, the, but the school district needed to fill those spaces, so they were concerned about moving a choice school there that they weren't sure that would you know, address the capacity needs. But what this process did, it said, okay, well let's take a very high performing choice school within our system that we know we can fill, that we know we have a waiting list for, and that's the school that moved to that location. So it alleviated all the concerns of the folks within for, you know, the neighborhood school that didn't want to necessarily be forced to send their children there. But you now have a, a home for a, you know, the um, HP Woodlawn program, a very successful program that can really be designed to their needs. So I think that was r really, a key example of taking the community's input and and bringing it into a process to come up with a decision that people again when we started this process in, in the fall I honestly thought it was a non-starter I thought there was no way we would be able to build a school on that site just because of the the significant pushback and at the end you have a school community that is thrilled to be at that site so that's I think one of the key important absolutely and we'll move to the next one the main takeaway here is not that you need to build a five-story school the main takeaway is that after about a decade and a half of no movement on that site a design process and a very clear decision feedback loop where everyone knew who was making what decision where is what finally moved that forward. So it's an interesting example. Other one, a little bit closer to home as well for you guys, George Washington University. I know some of you probably know a little bit about their development plan. Why we put this one up here, it's a project Sherry and I worked on very, very long time. Um, this is a really interesting example of a public-private partnership that involved uh, a residential need of a university and a school need for Washington, D.C. So the building on the right is called the School Without Walls. It's a magnet school in D.C. It's a public school located on GW's campus. Great school, one of the top schools in the city, but it was falling apart, literally. It's called the School Without Walls because kids used the city as their classroom, but it was known as the school without windows, walls, doors, and ceilings because it was literally falling apart. So we put together over many, many years a partnership where the university needed more space to put its students. We needed residence halls, construction, et cetera, when we were working with them. We didn't have much more room to do that. The school had a parking lot behind it. it no, it wasn't a parking lot. It was a tennis court. Tennis court and parking lot? 
from the parking lot. So we bought the air rights and development rights to their parking lot and tennis court as we were working with them, built a 450 bed residence hall um, there for students on the back end of a very small site and on the front end, the university contributed to the redevelopment of the school without walls. There's a very intense and complex public-private partnership underlying all of this that we're happy to go into if that's of interest to anyone, but what made this really unique is that it went beyond a building deal and it became an academic deal. So it, there's no athletic facilities within the school without walls. They use all of the facilities at the university. So they didn't need to build that into a very constrained site. Today, juniors and seniors at the school without walls take classes at George Washington University and graduate high school with an associate's degree from GW. So they're getting a $100,000 degree as high school seniors. That's what happens when you collate education and commercial and residential. This is a university setting. You've got universities here. That doesn't make this the right deal. It's another example of how if you put together, whether it's connected officially or not, when things are done concurrently, it frees up the ability. This project hadn't been built for 15 years because the, the city couldn't figure out how to fit everything it needed into this building and find the excess capital. By bringing a university in, they found excess space and the university was willing to donate money to the development of this in return for development rights. So it's just an interesting way to, to structure a deal. The second one is also related to GW and we, we put it on here because it happened around the same time and I'm gonna ask Sherry to, to talk about this one. Okay, this is a project many of you may be familiar with. Um, George Washington University Hospital it was built in the 1940s um, on the site that Jason to across the street from the Foggy Bottom Metro right at 23rd and I Street. You know, incredibly visible and active um, uh, intersection of the city. Um, this the university built a new hospital across the street right above the metro. And so now you had this 2.5 acre site at Washington Circle on Pennsylvania Avenue at the metro right for redevelopment. Um, the, universi the university because of, you, you may have heard it's a little bit expensive to go to GW, um, really had maxed out in terms of its tuition, um, needed to find some other tuition driven, non-tuition driven for, so forms of revenue. And as GW has done, as you also, you know, for, by its reputation, it has leveraged its location. And that's one of the way it, it, it ways it, it really does uh, look to to raise revenue. So it had this site, it wanted to use it for commercial purposes. At the same time, the community was clamoring, absolutely not, university, you're growing too fast, you're growing outside your boundaries, you're taking over hotels, you're taking over apartment buildings, we need you to use that site for your own uses. And at the end of the day, what the university was able to do was work at a commercial um, uh, transaction with Boston Properties of Partnership um, by showing the city and showing the community that if you allowed the university to grow up on its existing campus, grow up in its core with higher densities, higher lot coverage, things like that that wouldn't that adversely impact the surrounding community, the, the city got behind a plan for economic development on that site with uh, almost a million square feet of office, retail, and um, residential, um, including a 35,000 35, square foot grocery store which was desperately needed in that neighborhood. Um, so at the end of the day, you have this amazing transformational project of the gateway of the campus, serving the community, and providing all these things that the community had really looked for for so long that just couldn't take hold in, in, in Foggy Bottom. Um, and it really became, again, for the city, a, a landmark project. And it's one of, the, one of Boston property's highest performing projects in the country. Why this one is relevant and why we thought it made sense here is the university used the revenue from that site, and we can get into deal structure if you're interested, but it's a ground lease, 90 year ground lease? 60 year ground lease. The university is using the revenue from that site to fund its academic purposes. They built a $275 million science and technology center that they wouldn't be able to do without the underpinning finances of that building. There's no way they could build that out of existing internal budget or by raising tuition, but they needed to build a modern science facility to be competitive. So they used the ground lease from a straight up commercial development to fund academic and educational uses, which I think does have some parallel to some of the things that have been talked about over the last couple of years here is how you use one for the other. The other thing here is just leveraging the, the, the real estate that you have, um, it would have been really easy to use Square 54 right on Pennsylvania Avenue for university use. There were a lot of people arguing that we needed to. We worked with ULI and a whole bunch of other people to say, this is probably one of the most valuable pieces of land we have left to develop in downtown Washington. We need to do that to its highest and best use. So looking at what else is around there, either now or in the future, and figuring out, is there an econo 
ec economic development piece that we would short change by taking a shortcut and, and just doing it for, for university uses, which was interesting. And then the last one, which which will probably resonate with where you guys are, is Dalton, uh, Dalton Public Schools in Dalton, Georgia. If you've not been to Georgia, or not been to Dalton, Georgia, it's about an hour and a half outside of Atlanta, phenomenal little town. It's called the carpet capital of the world because most of the carpet industry came out of there. I'll give you three minutes of background on this, and then Tim will walk you through the very similar process that we're doing with their school board and their, their city council. Um, Dalton, in the late 70s and early 80s, had the highest um, per capita amount of millionaires of anywhere in the country. The carpet capital of the world was there, the wealth stayed in the community, etc. Through lots of demographic changes, a lot of them due to immigrant labor building the Atlanta Olympics in 96, and then afterwards figuring out where to go, what industries could support them. The, uh, the demographic, demographics of Dalton shifted dramatically in 15 years, to the point that the school is now 70% Latino and 70% free and reduced lunch. That happened in a period of 15 years. They're still graduating 90% of their students. They started a newcomer academy to take kids who've never been in school and get them into college. They're doing remarkable things there. In the process of doing that, they only had one high school and it was falling apart. So they tried three different times to get their community on board with a bond to build a 90 to $100 million school, and it failed each time because right or wrong, the community didn't think they could afford or that was the right place to spend money. So they were stuck. The school was falling apart, the boilers weren't working, the air conditioning wasn't working, they needed to either rent renovate or build or put lots of trailers out and they couldn't figure out how to get over this. Can we afford it? Can we not? Is there a larger process here or not? That's when we were brought in after I think it was the second year-long community engagement process fell apart due to some paralysis and decision making. We were brought in to say, is there a path forward? And I'll let Tim talk through that. Absolutely. It's um, like Michael said, it has a lot of similar challenges to what we've seen in Falls Church, but there's also opportunity in that they have an aging facility, they have overcrowding, and they need a solution as a school system. And as we had some early conversations with them, we conducted a series of stakeholder audits to make sure we were talking to as many community members and representatives as we could to understand what happened in their processes, what questions they were asking, and what some of the hinge points were where things either did or didn't go so well. From there, we had some great discussions with the Chamber of Commerce, with the mayor, with the council, with the neighboring state college, with the healthcare system, and many more. So what we sought to do was kind of gather all of those hinge points, ask all the right questions, and see how we could organize the data. Not to say you need to go out and re-engage the community and come up with a vision, but to say you have all of these great ideas. Which questions do you need to ask and in which order? Once they paused it, we had to get them to a point where they could agree what it was they were actually trying to achieve. So we worked with the school board and the school staff and the superintendent and their director of communications to get them to say at the end of a process, whatever it looks like, how will we define success? What does that look like? And this is a statement that they voted on as a board to adopt and they voted unanimously to say we are committed to the goal of preserving the Dalton difference. For them, that's a proud history. They're in Georgia, they have a lot of academic, a lot of athletic tradition, and they are innovators. That's really important to them, and so as they think about their community, they need to preserve that in their minds. They wanna seek a smaller middle school and two smaller high schools, which also incorporate the successful programs of Morris Innovative High School. Their middle school has 1,800 kids, Dalton High School, has 1,800 also, and Morris Innovative has 400 students. They are at capacity, and not everyone even agreed on that. But what they realized was they needed to figure out a long-term solution, and they wanted to bring the students from Morris Innovative, take all of those programs that were working, and bring them back into a centralized high school or two smaller high schools that were developed equitably. What's exciting about Morris Innovative is they have some amazing programs that have been recognized nationally. They have a newcomer's academy that is taking students who are coming coming in to the 11th grade even, never speaking English, never sitting through an American curriculum, and they're learning the language and the subject matter and how to go to school all at the same time, many of them while they're still working and supporting their families. They need to preserve that and celebrate it, but find a way to bring it in. As we had these discussions, and after the board unanimously approved this, we were able to arrange what looks like a game board because we realized, as we talked to them, a lot of them were describing it as a game of uh, shoots and ladders almost. They said, we get so far, and then it seems like we slide back down. What we decided was to arrange it in a way that we said, sure, it's a game board and we need to advance the token, but how are we going to do that, and what are the decision points that will make it possible? So 
you see here there are four phases to the game. There's setting the stage, there's logistics, there's programming, and there's implementation. In early, re early revisions of this, we weren't sure exactly what would go in which order. A lot of it depended on the community, the board members, and which hinge points were really critical to the community members. They agreed that there needed to be fact-finding. Some people thought the school system was growing, some people thought it would shrink, some people thought that there was enrollment available in neighboring schools. No one really agreed on the facts. They decided that they would research it, vote on it, and move forward. The partnership here you see is an off-ramp. There's a lot of opportunity with the groups I mentioned, but the question was, is this something that the school system is pushing forward, or is it the responsibility of the mayor, the council, and others to really push for this? We set it up as an off-ramp that we could explore in the future. And the final one in setting the stage is the economic climate. In fact finding, you might look at what is your legal debt margin, what you can legally borrow through taxes and other funding sources. Economic climate says, great, we just hit a recession that some of us still feel like we're coming out of. What can we actually afford? So there's a $300 million legal debt margin, but $90 million for a high school might feel a little tough at that point. As you can see here through the rest of them, we arranged the additional questions that they agreed on as capacity, logistics, innovative programs and learning models, and then finally, how do you implement and zone and make it happen? Do you have to do it in phases or can you do it all at once? This came from the vision that they had. This is a breakdown, uh, a little blown up image of the partnership just to show some of the groups that were at play. They have a lot of collaborative voices coming together and they're all looking to each other to kind of put the first shovel in the ground to make the first step and write the first check. So they're still exploring this in a way that I feel like is very similar. But what's exciting for them is that the school system and their discussions have been a catalyst to spark the future development. Um, and it's really opening the door for future opportunities. The school system has an urgent facility need that they must address. They have to move forward on a process to find a solution to that. In the meantime, you have groups like the Dalton Chamber of Commerce who are doing strategic visioning and strategic plans. You have Dalton State College who are doing strategic plans. And they're all doing this kind of concurrently so that the development of a school doesn't preclude future opportunities or development on the site. So let me, let me try and tie this back directly to where I think you guys might be on a couple sections of this. What got really interesting here, if you go back one to the, the partnership, the, the partnership wasn't even a part of this when we came in. We were supposed to come in and figure out if the board could agree to build a school and at what, what price point. That was our task. As we did stakeholder audits, which is a fancy word for call a whole bunch of people, we talked to 40 different community leaders and figured out they were all doing their own planning. They all had their own vision for what economic development should look like. And when you talk to university presidents, they had one idea and the chamber had an idea and they were we're all saying somewhat similar things about the potential, but they weren't saying it to each other in a way that made any sense. So the, the game board was paused momentarily to explore the partnership. What happened is we started hosting these meetings with university leadership, transportation leadership, the mayor got involved, the city council held a joint meeting, and everyone said, yeah, there's a lot here. And then you reach that point in any process where what does that mean? Does a lot here mean we're actually going to write a check and do something together? Or does a lot here mean that over the next decade we could do some really cool things together? And that's where a lot of processes stop. Is it, I'm, I don't know enough to have this opinion here. There's unbelievable potential when you look at a map of who's surrounding your area. I'm, I'm qualifying it just with that. When I look at two universities and a metro and commercial developers that are doing stuff around the region that are remarkable and you own land in the middle of that, the potential seems remarkable. Potential doesn't help you get something built, right? And so in this case, it became, let's explore the partnership. They paused the process for about, in this case, about four months to have three or four public meetings with all these bodies to get them all on record saying they wanted to do this. And where they are now, and they're supposed to vote on this at their September meeting, is they're going to say, there's enough here for a partnership that we are going to go forward with school development, but we're going to do it in a way that doesn't preclude or get in the way of all the commercial possibilities we think are here. So that's, that's where they are. Then in October, they're supposed to vote on what number they think the school should afford. And there's a lot of differing thoughts on how to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm generally more of a fan in the cities we work in of designing the school and then figuring out the price. In Dalton, they want to pick a price and then design a school. You can do it both ways, and you can make pros and cons for both. But where we are in this one is let's do a partnership, but we know the school can't wait for the partnership to come together, so let's go forward with the school, but do it in such a way that additional development is possible. Each situation very different. Some of this may resonate, some of it may not, but what we took an attempt at, and I want to qualify this, and, and when we were asked to present this, I got a slight bit nervous. I don't get nervous presenting very often, but we're basing some th early thoughts on Falls Church on, on about a week and a half of talking with some folks and reading everything we can about this. So what we put together was a one-pager, which we're going to hand out here. 
on the top of it is a basic understanding of how I was trying to take this much research of every report that's been written and figure out where I think we are right now as a body. I didn't find anything out there that kind of said, this is where we started and where we came from. There were memos, there were other really great things. This was an outsider's opinion at, is this where we are in the process? And if there's agreement that this is where we are, here are some decision buckets that might be helpful as you move forward, whether we're part of the process or not, those might be some helpful decision categories to look at as you're trying to think of two bodies making a joint decision. So Tim, do you want to walk through the understanding and I'll, I'll walk through the decision points? Absolutely. So you all have this in front of you. Um, it's also up on the screen. If the we have extra copies, we can distribute these in the back. Perfect. The initial uh, narrative here is familiar to all of you, so I don't want to spend too much time walking through it. But it was some of the key points that we saw and that we ha heard in some of our early discussions that says this is a process or a series of processes that began several years ago. Uh, it was put together as a joint planning process for the larger high school and middle school and potential economic development on the 34-acre site. In the summer of 14, the Joint Campus Steering Committee um, they did an analysis with RTKL and basically looked at the site options. And then in October 2014, it's when the ULI TAP study was conducted to look at the potential. And the phrase we saw from there that we included here was the agora, the idea that you really have a coming together here of all of these different forces and factors but that could be a real market of sharing ideas, economy, uh, and information. From there, the request for detailed proposals was put out, and I understand there were two proposals that were submitted. They were evaluated, and the group decided to push pause on the process in order to, um, to better evaluate some of these opportunities. Um, we know that adjacent to the site in Fairfax County are the campuses of Virginia Tech and University of Virginia, as well as the West Falls Church Metro that we've already discussed, and all of the potential that comes with that. Um, the, where it currently stands, as we see it, is the need to identify key decision points along these two concurrent tracks now that we have. And we need to ensure that those decisions are made from a solid foundation of the facts and the input of the voices that we've heard. And we'll say very clearly, these are, these are four categories along two tracks. And these questions that Michael will walk through are representative of the questions that need to be addressed and thought through, but it is not an exhaustive or a comprehensive list. There's a lot more to dig into in each section, and Michael will walk through some of those now. And this becomes the part, and I'll walk through this and then answer questions, and we can have some discussion. This is the part where if there's agreement around the room that you guys have already answered these, that's amazing. You're further along than you think you are. If there's some open questions or some debate among where we are on these, we put them out there simply because to get from where we think you are to, to a decision point, these are generally the types of questions that you're going to need to answer. So straight up, what is the factual foundation that we're all working from, and do we all agree with that? What are the demographic proje projections for the city and the enrollment projections? for the school system? Do we have a, a, a number that we're all using that we all agree with or not? What are the funding streams available? That's a really complicated one. They could have three pages of its own. Is there TIF financing? Is there bond financing? What foundational funding mechanisms are available for this? Then what other legal and infrastructure requirements, amenities, sewage, power, et cetera, must be accounted for in an initial plan? And how does that square up with what might be needed if additional development happened later on. Those generally aren't things that fall into the opinion category, right? Generally, those are facts. There are lots of things in planning that are opinion-based. What can we afford is an opinion question, right? How many students do we think we have in the school are we going to have generally is a fact question. So generally when we're starting a process or getting into a process, it's important to get kind of the bodies agreed in, in a public way on, on, on the projections and the facts. If you then continue down that column and look at the high school, which, which would move forward at some level, when do we need to move forward with a new school and at what price point? How far apart are we on that? How will 21st century design concepts be considered? There's been some pretty remarkable visioning. Um, I, I don't have an opinion on any side of this, but I was really impressed with the reports that I read that included students and parents. We do work in communities across the country where the first thing we say when people present us with a hugely designed school is, did you talk to your students? And they look back at you like, that never happened. I was really impressed in here to see parents and students that seem to be, from an outsider's perspective, pretty heavily engaged in that. And then can renovation and expansion provide a 21st century learning environment and a community hub cheaper or more efficient than new construction? 
there's a lot in that question. I think every system deals with, are we building new or are we renovating? And what are the opportunities involved in each? If you go to the other side of the page, when you look at a grand partnership, what are the goals and needs of neighbors like Virginia Tech, UVA, WMATA, and others? There are lots of partners here. Have we asked them specifically in a leadership level what their goals are and how we can do this together. Has there been joint planning? Has there not? Do we know where all of this, this fits on their radar? Do these shared ambitions impact future visions and opportunities? That's a question of, does anything we're doing today get in the way of us doing something really great in the future? And if so, and we think there is a great future with any of these partners, how do we make sure that what we develop today, at the very least, doesn't prevent future opportunities? Do the various timelines and schedules in play for each potential partner match up? You could have, and I have no inside baseball on this, you can go to Virginia Tech and they say, yeah, that's great, and in 15 years we'd love to do something, right? That's a timeline that you then say, great, do we develop to that, or do we develop in such a way that in 15 years there's potential, or is that way too long for our planning horizon, we're gonna do what we need to do? And then co-location, the joint process has been concluded, but what considerations must be made to address the school system's urgent needs without precluding future opportunities? So how do you go down one path well out without kind of getting in the way of, of potential opportunities for commercial development, which is on the bottom. What development best serves the needs and goals of the Falls Church community? What planning, land use, zoning, infrastructure, and transportation needs to be considered? And how can the city be proactive to catalyze this development? And you get into deal structure, and you get into marketing, and you get into why do people find certain parcels of land um, really appealing and, and, and other people don't. So all of those things are things that I would imagine you've struggled with at nauseum. Our attempt here was to try and put them into some categories that say the easiest way, and this is going to sound judgmental and it's not, it, I, I don't mean this to be judgmental at all, the easiest way to kill any deal is to ask a whole bunch of questions in an order that doesn't make sense, right? Think about this outside of planning. If you don't want something to happen or you don't know how to get there, you're going to ask a whole bunch of questions that can't possibly answer it at that point in the process and then things break down. So what, what should happen with something like this, if these are even in the realm of the right questions, would be that then work as a board to put them in an order that makes sense. Do we need to wait on developing a high school to let the commercial get a bit further? It seems like this body's decided Probably not, that's why they've been decoupled. We need to be building a high school. Again, outsider's perspective. If that's where you are, how do you do that in a way that doesn't preclude commercial development without making it contingent on it? And if, if we hear back that no, they have to be done at the same time, that's, that's a deal. How do you put that together? So it's about taking the questions, ordering them in a way that doesn't cause nothing to happen, but doesn't get in the way of future development. Does that make sense? So that is the extent of, of what we prepared. I hope some of it resonated, and I'd be happy to, um, if appropriate, take questions or turn it back over to you. Okay, questions only at this time. It looks like we lost our video. I thought it was a very not subtle way of saying <laughs> stop talking. <laughs> I'm going to shut the screen off. If you jiggled a cord or, or hit something, that would be my recommendation. <laughs> Thank you very much for that very informative presentation. We, we really appreciate it. Um, why don't we go ahead and open up to questions or comments. Any folks have any questions or comments for our guests tonight? Mr. Z? Hi, it's Dan Z, uh, City Council. Uh, uh, can you just briefly uh, provide the qualifications uh, of uh, the principals here tonight? Uh, uh, you, um, Mike, uh, Sherry, and Timothy. Yeah. So uh, professional qualifications? Sure. Perfect. So I spent, um, I spent a number of years as a community organizer, but after that I spent a decade with George Washington University leading their government, international, and community relations. So I did their government work, their lobbying at a local district and international level, and then I did their community outreach and community organizing work across the country. I then spent a number of years with a consulting firm, a large consulting firm, about 150 person firm that did community development work around the country. A lot of work with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, a lot of work in really highly impoverished and highly urban areas. Um, left that to start my own firm five years ago. And this firm specializes on community-based engagement. We have 30 people now. We just hired another. We have 30 people. We have um, offices in D.C., St. Louis, um, Phoenix, Tampa, and Cincinnati. We have about 180 clients from coast to coast, and, and all of them fit somewhere in the community engagement realm. So that's my background. Sherry, do you want to give yours? I could give your background. I know um, yeah, my name is Sherry Rutherford. Um, I worked for approximately 20 years at George Washington University. I was the director of real estate planning and development at GW before my quasi-retirement uh, in 2007. Since that time, I've been um, an independent consultant 
working with universities, um, K-12 systems, and other mostly nonprofits, but also on the commercial side as well. Um, mostly on very co um, contentious or highly regulated development pro projects. So either an issue with um, a compl complex real estate deal or again, a very high level of, of community, community engagement. Um, right now I'm working um, extensively with um, Georgetown University. Again, I continue to work with G George Washington University. Arlington Public Schools, and I team up with um, my friends at Link on a lot of projects across the country. Again, in those types of types of scenarios where you've got a school district or a university facing a really challenging development issue. You've done some charter school work with really innovative financing as well, which has been interesting. Yes, um, I also worked at, uh, particularly in the district. Um, I I the challenges facing charter schools—they've got you know, s a significant portion of, of DC public schools. So public school students are in the charter program, but they don't have the facility support that obviously a traditional public school program does. So what you find is all these charters are churning through space three and four and five times until at, you know, paying market rate, finding any space they can. Um, so I worked with a lot of charters to, to, to try to take decommissioned DCPS facilities and make them into viable schools, and it's been a very successful program. I only mentioned the charter um, because if, if you think about the, the deal structure that has to happen for financing a charter school, they generally don't have the public resources that other schools do. So Sherry's worked in some really complex land use deals that had some really innovative funding structures, including nonprofit financing and others. And Tim is the type of person that you want on your team. Tim is that success story of a millennial who came in and worked hard and got ahead. Tim started as my executive assistant. He grew to my special assistant about eight months ago, became a director in the firm, and is running some of our most complex projects in different cities um, and, and I say that in a room full of educators because this is how it's supposed to happen you're supposed to have someone come in and you're supposed to groom them and if they take that they get ahead and Tim does that better than anyone so he provides a lot of support on the work that we do Did that answer your question yes thank you very much and I do have a follow-up question while others are trying to frame up their questions for you not to take too much time with that but uh, given what you know which is uh, uh, admittedly uh, a lot but perhaps insufficient given um, that we are, a, I guess, our, the Falls Church difference is uh, we pride ourselves on community engagement. So um, do you have a notion of how long this process would take? Uh, decades, years, months, however you want to. That's a tough question. Um, from the background that we have, It honestly is going to depend a lot on what you need to get out of this. If you need to get a school built, I don't think this is a long process. It seems like I've read a lot of visioning studies. It seems like all of that stuff that would normally be the next step has kind of already been done. So getting a school built in this environment, not knowing anything about the public financing appetite or what people think they can afford, it seems like a lot of the back end planning that usually goes into that has already been done. And, and I encourage anyone to push back if I'm getting that wrong. So it doesn't seem like it would be that long of a timeline to get a school done. If you're going to get a commercial development done as part of that or an, a, adjacent to that, it becomes a real estate master planning exercise at that point. And again, I would like everyone to push back if anyone thinks I'm getting that wrong, but many jurisdictions wait to zone land because they think it'll make it more appealing to developers, and often it scares developers away because it looks like an uncertain environment, right? So there, are, those are elements of a real estate deal structure. Those have nothing to do with a timeline. It means if we think the market responded the way it did because the land wasn't zoned, how long does it take to zone land, and how long does it take to zone land appropriately? Those are two very different questions, right? So those are questions that I don't honestly have an insight on at this point, but the parameters of a deal seem to be there depending on what needs to happen in what, in what order. Does that make sense? And I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit hampered by not having the three and a half years of background that, that all of you have on this, but hopefully that makes some sense. Ms. Gill? Hi, Erin Gill, uh, school board. Um, I only have a few months' experience as well. So, <laughs> um, so uh, one of your points on here is how can the city be proactive to catalyze um, this development? And that's something I'm really curious about. How can we go out and proactively seek what we think would be a good fit um, on a school site? Um, 
That's a, that's a good question. So in Arlington, we did a design competition where you had a whole bunch of architects come in and you made it really appealing for them to want to be part of that design process, right? Um, in other places, there have been big public visioning sessions, but it seems like have already happened here and people wanted to be a part of it. The, the more challenging aspect, and, and again, trying not to speak way out of turn here because I don't have enough to back up any of what I'm saying in this specific jurisdiction, the people who build schools is a much smaller universe than the people who build commercial and residential developments. So what makes a school project appealing to a developer and an architect is generally very different than what makes a residential or commercial project appealing, right? So in the school construction place, you have people who do nothing but schools who want to win a contract to show that they're doing the latest and greatest, or you have architects like Big who've never done a school but need that in their portfolio, so they're willing to kind of deeply discount what their commercial fee would be to do a school. And generally, you need something unique and challenging about the site for someone like that to jump at it. On the commercial and residential side, there's this completely intangible, and I'll turn this over to Sherry if she wants to add anything to this, there's this completely intangible factor of buzz Right? What buzz does a site have? How well has it been marketed? How many people have done the hard hat tours before there's anything that could fall on them? What else is out there that gets people excited? That becomes a, a, a large reason that developers get interested, and then the deal structure and the financing have to be set up in a way that it's viable for them. So it's kind of a two-page process, right? Just getting developers interested doesn't mean they're gonna respond to an RFP, but there's a process for getting them interested. Is there anything you would add to that? Sorry. I just, just look at, to reiterate, I just think a, a really solid market analysis and knowing what that market will bear um, from your, before you go out is really critical. Um, and keeping that current because it's shifting so much. The, the, the only th other thing I would add to that is what a community wants on a site in development and, and what a site can bear are, are generally different things. And so having some realistic discussions around that makes sense. I'll use the GW example. The community wanted a grocery store and that seemed to make sense. There wasn't a grocery store in the area. The grocery store became an amenity to the project that was kind of proffered to the city to say, it doesn't make any economic sense to put 40,000 square foot dedicated to grocery store use. They can't pay the square footage rent that anyone else can, so we're subsidizing the inclusion of a grocery store. On that site, you also couldn't have trucks blocking up the hospital, so all the loading and unloading have to happen underground in a parking garage. If you've ever tried to build underground parking and anyone knows how expensive that is, try building a level that has to have tractor trailer trucks turn around. So at that point, the, the community really wanted a grocery store and the development was committed to it, but there had to be an understanding that that wasn't something that was a nice amenity, that was something that was added to the project that cost the developer and the team a lot of money, so there were other things that couldn't go on the project because of that. So it's possible to find that middle ground, but just understanding what people want. It's really easy to say we want a, we want a movie theater and we want a bowling alley and we want all that. If the market won't bear it, no one's gonna come even if it's really well designed. So just having that market analysis is helpful. Ms. Oliver? So, as I often do, I would like to push back. Um, and I wanna go back to something that was said about which way do you go about doing this? Do you design your dream school and then figure out how to pay for it? Or do you figure out what you can afford and figure out how much of the school you want you can get for that? And I think that the underlying issue in this process is that we don't have agreement on what approach we're going to take. And there's a lot of concern in the community about the underlying affordability and um, the, the magnitude of what we're talking about for our city and our budget is, is really, really key. And within our community as a whole right now, there are schisms. There's a vocal minority for whom schools are everything and a vocal minority for whom we spend too much on the schools. Um, we have a vocal minority who thinks development is a good thing, and we have a vocal minority that hates the thought of any development. And in general, we do have a crisis of affordability. Compared to our larger neighbors, we have a higher ta residential tax rate, okay? So I think that before we say we're engaged on parallel processes and going off, we need to answer the underlying question. 
Are we building our dream school if it bankrupts us or not? Or are we calculating what we can afford and seeing how much we can stretch to get the minimum that we need? I, I don't disagree with anything you said. Uh, we've worked very aggressively in, in jurisdictions that have done it both ways. So it's definitely possible to plan in either direction. Um, let me use Dalton as an example, and I want to be careful because the school board hasn't voted to move forward on what their number is yet, but the last two times the school has been taken out to the community, it's been in the 90 to $120 million range. There was a belief in that community that they couldn't, they couldn't spend that much money, right? That was their belief in that community, and there are some school board members that had a very specific number in mind that they wouldn't go above. Architects, planners, design charrettes came in and said, I understand that, but we can't build anything for the number you're proposing. So we're working together actively right now, working together with a whole other series of meetings at the end of August to figure out if the project as a whole costs this much and the school's piece of it is only this much, how do you make up that difference? And in this case, they're looking at a school as a generator of economic development in a pretty dilapidated downtown. And so they're looking at what land does the city have to put in? What does private industry have to put in? What is the university doing on its own that could better be done there? And can they make up the difference between what some school board members think they can't go above and what all their architects are telling them they can't go below? And the, the, that's what we have to figure out between here and October is can we make up that difference to build something at a number that people think they can do while still building what the town thinks it needs. And I, I think we're going to get there, but those are not decisions that we control. That's a public body kind of struggling with how they want to finance a development like that. Does that make sense? It, it does. And my only point is that until the two bodies agree which approach we're taking, dream and figure out how to pay for it, even if it bankrupts us, or what can we afford? Okay, what can the architect do as a minimum? Right. So there's a t there's a difference in approach, and I think that is the critical first step that we as joint bodies need to take, so that we can stop being paralyzed and move forward. Is the just fact finding? Is there a number that people have been talking about? For, for what? For the school. Yes. Yes. Great, and we're all in agreement on what that number is. Okay. <laughs> Are we all in agreement in what that number no, has been I mean, talked the, about the publicly, number, or is that? I, I think the number for a new build school is about a hundred million dollars, give or take. So that that is the number that's out there. Yeah. Now, I think the question is, is that number affordable or not? And then the question is, how do you define affordable from financing and from development? But, uh, you know, if you want to know what the marker is out there right now, I'd say that that is it. Right. And, and we, we uh, I am not a cost estimator for schools. Me having an opinion on how much to spend on schools isn't terribly appropriate. I think communities rebel when they think they're getting Cadillac schools when they don't need Cadillac schools or when they think extra expensive things are being thrown in that don't help with education. I would say that in the seven or eight districts we're in right now, that's a ballpark number that is pretty typical. Whether that's affordable or not is a completely different story, but that's, a, that's not out of the realm of what we're hearing in other jurisdictions. The biggest thing, and again, not school cost estimators, the biggest thing is understanding what standard the school system here builds to. So we do a lot of work in DC, and they build to a 100 to 125 year building standard, right? That's part of being a federal system that has a $15 billion operating budget, right? So you, you've toured some of their schools, I'm sure. You go to HD Woodson, you go to Dunbar. These are 150, 170, 190 million dollar schools, depending. They're building to a 150 year building standard, so they're using building materials that you would likely see in a federal government building, not in a school, because they're building them to that standard. I don't have an opinion on if that's right or wrong. We're working in Austin, Texas, which builds to a 40 to 50 year building standard because their population is changing so rapidly. They don't want to build a 100 year school and then in 25 years need to build something else. Those drive cost of school, right? What building standard you're going to, what setup, how much technology you're putting in the buildings. Often your technology costs are, are a huge part of building a new 21st century school. You've done media and I'm sorry, you've done visioning studies on this, I'm sure. And so the, hopefully that's nothing new that you're hearing. I don't have an opinion on it, but getting that number figured out, at least the ballpark wise, is, is probably something that is worth some larger discussion. And, and I would just say that the number that's out in the community is 112, or if you think we're going to add the bells and whistles, 120 million. The financial policy limit on what we can afford is about 40, 
and with economic development, maybe 80. So those are three big different tranches of, of building affordability. And I think that is, to some extent, where we're paralyzed. And I, I like the process you describe about saying, here's the upper limit, and here's the minimum of what we can build for, and then figuring out the gap. But that's really different from starting on a parallel process where one body is asking for quotes on a $112 million school, and the other body is saying, I can only give you $40 million, or maybe 80 if we get economic development down the line. Well, and I think Ms. Oliver is really touching on the fact that these are not parallel processes. Okay. Because, first of all, the, the school occupies the, much of the land that would be developed. Right. So you have your phasing issues. And I think what it is is you, you're, you're jumping back and forth. You, you've got the school program, then you've got how do you pay initially before there's any economic development, and then there's how do you build on, on the economic development that comes when, and how much is that for what. So you're, you're, you're kind of jumping back and forth. And so I don't know how big the Dalton site is, and I don't know if they're confronting some of these issues where you're cheek by jowl of your development land and your school program. But, but it is a very intricate bit of choreography that I think you have to do, or else you know, you start phase one and then there's no development to pay for phase two and then what do you do? Right. Absolutely. And, and we keep using Dalton because I actually think it's actually really relevant to where you guys are right now. There are plenty of other examples out there, but in, in Dalton's case, there's a $17 million differential between them building a campus downtown that could spur economic development and building it out in the rural part of the town where it wouldn't spur anything, but it would be $17 million cheaper. And that's the difference between what the school board thinks they can afford and what the architect thinks they need. So the easy solution is just to not build a school downtown and to move it out, out to the skirts of town why that hasn't happened yet is because there's this belief that there's spin-off economic development that would be a waste to ignore at this point. They might not get there. They might just have to build a school on the outskirts, but they're deeply exploring how they can do spin-off economic development because in Dalton, a $90 million expenditure would be one of the largest public expenditures, period. So if you're going to spend that level of public money, how do you do it in a way that the impact goes beyond the school is the, the argument that the powers that be are making there. We, of course, don't have outskirts to consider. <laughs> <laughs> Although we're already on the outskirts. Exactly. <laughs> this, we, the Upper West Side are our outskirts. Um, may I? Uh, thank you. You referred to uh, asking questions in an order that makes sense. And you also spoke to enrollment as one of the uh, fact points uh, along the journey. I think that that's relevant to hear because um, you know, right now we have in our high school, how many kids? It's under 800. It's under 800. Eight, 900. <laughs> and, you know. Not quite 800. 800, okay. One of the smallest schools, obviously, right. anywhere around these parts. And we're talking about building a facility that would accommodate roughly twice that. And that, that assertion that we've made does not sit well with you know, uh, at least a portion of the community. So I think we have a journey to take to, uh, you know, explain why we think that we need a school that is almost twice as large as the one we have now. And uh, if we do eventually need that, is there some way to phase the construction so that, you know, the people who live here and now pay our taxes are not paying to build a school that really may not be, portions of it may not be used for another generation or two even. So at least as far as I'm concerned, one of the questions that we need to deal with right up front is that. And also as it relates to our other facilities, as you may know, if you've read uh, what's going on in town, you know, we're, we're on the cusp of trying to figure out what we're doing with the smallest the youngest age school and we just don't know the answer to that hopefully we will know uh, soon within a month um, but what happens with that facility also informs I think where the community at least is willing to go um, because if, if the Mount Daniel project as it's now conceived does not advance then I think we have to have a, 
another community conversation and visioning and so forth that takes that into account and takes stock of that and asks questions such as, you know, uh, is the way that we're distributing the kids across our various campuses going to have to be re-looked at if we cannot do what we want to do right. at Mount Daniel? But before you jump into that, Ms. Dr. Jones, maybe you can talk about the high school program just so everybody in the community is clear about what the proposal is for and what it could burst to. Um, well, what's in, the, what's in the program is building a high school for 1,200, and it is um, based on enrollment projections from Weldon Cooper out of UVA who do enrollment projections nationally, and that's based on natural birth rate and cohort projections. Um, what's not built into that is any economic development perhaps that will come within the city, new apartments or condos and that sort of thing. So the building is set um, at, a, at a classroom where we are maximizing our classrooms for the way that we actually believe 21st century instruction should look and that's 1200 students what it also means which I know you know if you work with schools can you totally max out a school and use every room every hour of the day with a different instructional model the pressure point for us you know two decades from now would be 1500 but we are building a school for 1200 students and that's based off projections the projection model that makes that makes sense um, kind of go with me on this and, and, and push back if you don't like it one of the really interesting things that we're seeing in really cool communities around the country right now is not spending a hundred million dollars on a school but spending a hundred million dollars on a facility that right now serves school needs but if the projections are off and in 50 years we don't need school needs half of it's a community center or half of it's a rec center so if you and, and, and this gets kind of abstract so so go with me on this but if, if you think of public financing of projects not specific to one use then you're as a community spending money on a community center that for now is built to the highest and best use of a school and if that changes can be used for different things so we're working in a project in austin right now where they have a an excess elementary school that had to be closed and it wasn't popular at all it didn't have enough population to support it but it was the center of community and the community said if you close this we will lose the center of community so Austin took all of the nonprofits didn't have their own space and put them in different classrooms and made it a hub for nonprofits right so you used the school building that was built for that the population can't sustain it and now it's a nonprofit hub and, and art center lots of models like that around the the country of how are schools being built for more than just schools still doesn't make the number easier but it says you know if for whatever reason every expert we have has the projection wrong we're building something that's large than just for this number over the next 50 years. Yeah, and I do think that we're trying to be thoughtful about that, and we probably can do more, more thought in that frame of reference, but um, because we need to go up and we need to compact the footprint, it does mean that when you co-locate the community with school children, yeah. the safety issues are, are really important, but we are, yeah. our um, central office right now actually rents space, and so we pay over $300,000 a year you know, for rental. And so we are putting our administration administration offices hopefully if we were doing this project so that we can get the admin kind of on the higher section of the building and so there will be thought to a separate entrance for adults and community so the building is very much I think functionally uh, the frame of thought is that it could function that way there's also a community gym access with it and that was asked for through the visioning that has a walking track in it so the building is open for people to come and walk in the winter um, the concept has been what's in the program is very open uh, space going into the building very much like what you see in Washington DC so that the community center I is right. there and there's a big open space so there's a lot of thought to that but I think as far as how you utilize any empty rooms when you open a building certainly there could be more thought in that direction any Ms. Hardy Thank you, uh, Letty Hardy, City Council. Um, well, first of all, thank you. I think it's always helpful to get some outside perspective on a problem that we've been struggling with for a while. Um, so we appreciate your insight and your help. Um, following up on what Ms. Oliver and Mr. Duncan both said, um, before starting on either of these tracks or these parallel tracks, I think we need to be explicit in declaring just precursor tracks. I think one of them is this question of affordability. Do we start with what can we afford? or do we build the dream school? I think that's a really key question we need to get agreement on and have an answer on. I think the second one, just to be more explicit, is we need to know how much land is needed for the school. So because of the Mount Daniel decision, we don't know whether we need 
the 10 acres or have 10 acres for development or if we need to decide to use that for elementary. And I don't know if there's agreement among this group on what that needs to look like, but I think that needs to be an explicit decision we lay out as before we embark on either of these, these are the two questions we should answer because right. otherwise we have no project right. if we don't answer those. So I just wanted to call that out and be more explicit in declaring that those are the things I think are needed before starting. Th this, I, this is not meant to be a facetious question at all. Do you around the table know what each other's kind of red lines are in terms of what has to be answered before anything moves forward? Do we, do we know that? Yeah. That that could be, whether you have a consultant or not, that could be a really helpful place to start is, whether it's an outside person or it's someone who's not directly involved in you guys, asking each of you what are those absolute fact pattern questions that you need answered before we can move anything forward. My sense is that there's probably about 15 or so questions that you're all asking in different ways, right? That would be a great thing to put on paper and then work through them and see are we really far apart on five of them, but 10 we can get through through some late night meetings, or are we far apart on 15 of them and then we have a very different process we need to run. Yeah, Does I that just, make sense? Yeah, I would just, that's a great point because I think I would add that it's not even the answers that we might right. disagree on, it's whether even those are the questions are the exactly. precursors or not. It's almost like the fact document without the answer part, right? It's the, the question and then collectively we need to come up with some answers. the people who are closest to this have those questions, uh, making huge assumptions here, but the, the community probably doesn't even have an understanding of what the questions are, right? So if, if we all have different questions and we all have different answers and then there's a community process that lasts for three and a half years, there's probably a really unique moment to go back and say, okay, this is where we are, and this is where we think we're going, what are the questions we collectively need answered? Any other questions, Vice Mayor Connolly? I just have a community engagement question because one of the things that we struggled with as we've gone along is, you know, everyone in this room probably has read all the reports you've seen and the community visioning sessions that we've had, we have 100 people or 200 people and that's amazing. But then there's 13,000 other people in Falls Church that are paying attention in different ways and that's something I feel like we struggle with as a community to try to get as many people, to get more than 500 people involved in the process. Do you guys have a way, how have you done that in other communities? That's a great question. Um, we believe very strongly in high touch and high tech engagement. Uh, high touch being there's absolutely no replacement for in-person community meetings. You can throw all the technology at the world at people and if you're not willing to meet with them face to face, you're not gonna, you're not gonna solve this. I don't know honestly how engagement is done here. I've been impressed with the reports that I've read. Most community engagement, you put community members in a room, you give a PowerPoint presentation and then you hand around a microphone to collect feedback, right? And so the people who are comfortable standing up and asking a question in those settings are generally the people who came to the meeting to ask a question. So we leave a lot of people out of that level of engagement. So we've had really good luck in school systems around the country recently of using some technology solutions to that. So still have the in-person meeting, but broadcast it via Periscope on Twitter or Facebook Live, which everyone says, you know, only certain demographics use that. I have every study in the world to prove that's not true. But even if it's only certain demographics that use those technologies, it costs nothing to broadcast your meetings that way. And then you let people at home engage from their couch and ask questions in a really innovative way. This doesn't work in every community, but um, in Arlington, we're doing Twitter town halls with Pat Murphy and the team and the architects around every project now. During our last one, we responded to 60 Twitter questions in an hour. Think of the level of efficiency in answering questions at that way, right? How many questions usually get through in a community meeting in an hour? That doesn't make that right or wrong, it just adds another tool. In Arlington, they do those at noon on a Friday to try and get people who can't come to a community meeting. In Arlington, with a huge, I'm sorry, in Austin, with a huge huge Hispanic population, we're doing them Friday mornings, right? Friday mornings at 8 a.m. was the, the time that school system selected. It's never a replacement for in-person, but it supplements it, which could be an interesting thing here. One of the things I think collectively is going to be really hard at this point in the process is everyone who's been involved in this has lived and breathed it for years. Right, And so I think there's probably gonna be a sense of we don't wanna go back and redo all that again because we've already done it. And I think that's natural and I think it's human and I think generally it's probably correct. There's probably going to need to be additional engagement out of whatever comes out of this because it's probably gonna be different than the last time you engaged with your community. That doesn't mean you pause everything for a year and do thousands of community meetings. It does mean don't be impatient around engagement just because you've done three years of it up to this point. Does that make sense? That does make sense. I would really, I would like to reach as many people as possible because as we go along, different people get inserted at different times and you do want to catch them up. 
whether they're people who've just moved to town or new decision makers. So you want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Right. And, and I think this may not be the right one pager. This was our attempt at putting something together, but something like that, maybe if it doesn't have the questions on it, that says as a body, we agree that this is the fact pattern of how we got here. And we're, I don't know if you need a vote or not, but we as collective bodies say, this is how we got here. And this is what's next. Even if what's next are a series of questions could be a really helpful way of making sure people are coming into this new, have a way to not have to read a whole bunch of pages to understand it. Anybody else on the school board have questions? Awfully quiet today. Oh, oh. I'll, <laughs> I can't. I can't help myself. No, um, I I agree with um, with Mr. Duncan, Ms. Oliver, and Ms. Hardy. I don't think we can. I I personally don't think we can move forward unless we know how much we can afford and what is happening with Matt Daniel. So I would suggest that we defer any future meetings until after the Mount Daniel decision comes back, so that we know what we know. That's going to be a whole other affordability issue if we have to start from scratch on the Mount Daniel project. Um, so I don't know that we can really move forward with this until we have answers. I think there is work that we could. Okay, Mr. Webb. Um, I, I slightly disagree with that. I think we can have some of the work done of, I think, at least talking some numbers wise, because that is the biggest sticking point of not knowing how much we're wanting to and willing to spend on this. Um, I think we can still have that and potentially at least have a framework in place um, while we're still waiting on the Mount Daniel so that we can at least not put everything on hold and then just have to just dive into everything all at, at one time. Um, but yes, I, I agree we do need to have some, some resolution to the Mount Daniel project, but um, to kind of stop in being that we've kind of put a couple of months in between when we initially stopped the PPEA process. Um, to now, and I don't think we want to lose too much ground on this, but I, I think having some limited work up until we get to a decision point within a month on the Mount Daniel, I think we should have a decision on, at, on that particular project, I hope, fingers crossed by then. Mr. Reagan. I'm happy to defer to Mr. Z if he wishes to go first. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, I guess I have a, a few observations as opposed to questions. Um, I, I, I think I, I disagree somewhat with Ms. Gill in the sense that I would agree with what everyone was saying. I think we do actually have to have a decision about Matt Daniel on the way forward because otherwise, as Ms. Hardy said, we don't have a project. Um, so we've got to define what the project is. Um, I think the, the biggest problem we've got right now is a bit of decision paralysis in the sense that this is actually a complicated question. Um, strike that. It's not complicated. It's complex. Um, it's complex in the sense that we have all of these different issues that are themselves complicated and they interrelate. So you tweak one a little bit and it changes the other ones. And so we get in these these processes where you know you get to a point as you say you know it's not intentional where people throw things off by asking the wrong questions at the wrong time they just they come up at the wrong time and so you never actually get out of the you know admiring the problem solution so we very much need a decision process that lets us make the decisions at the right time you know treat those decisions effectively as made um, so that we can go on and do other pieces but also explore options that we haven't explored. I know a lot of us, at least sorry, I will just talk for myself. I, I was frustrated when we were going through the last process and people would ask questions like, well, have we considered this partnership? And everyone said, yeah, we talked about that. But you know, there was no process to drive it to conclusion and to get an answer. You know, can we have a partnership with VA Virginia Tech? You know, what about the parking situation? What about the development around that? Um, and we need, to, we need to have a process to knit together the options that we've got and say they're real or they're not real, or here's what the timeline is, and then a decision process that causes us to move forward in a regular way. I mean, I, and I would agree with, with Ms. Oliver and Ms. Hardy that you know, we've, we've got to start with the what is affordable but 
you know, what is affordable depends upon the debt scenario and whether we do phase constructions and, and phase construction and what other partnerships may be available. Um, I, I worry a little bit that, you know, for at least all of the, you know, elected representatives around the table, this is a part-time job for us. Um, and for the um, administrative career people around the table, it is a full-time job, but it's a part-time of their full-time job. And this is a, you know, it's not like we go out and do this sort of thing all the time. So I, I'm 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 actually surprising myself by being supportive of using some external consulting resources just to make sure we've got the right decision process and we don't get locked in admiring the problem. Mr. Z. Thank you, Mayor. Actually, uh, Bravo, Phil. I think uh, I was going to talk about the need to address difficult questions and. And uh, it doesn't take much to write down a whole page, 30 seconds of difficult decisions. And uh, I think Phil said it very succinctly, very eloquently. Uh, and uh, the one decision he did identify at the end, I think that this group needs to address tonight. And I hope we have the time for it. And hopefully it's still within today as opposed to tomorrow, is uh, do we acquire staff? Do we have the staffed up in a way that we uh, uh, have a special district development authority with staff and specialists and consultants? Uh, I'm open to however we acquire staff, whether it's uh, you know hire, temporary hire, 1099 staff. Uh, there are a variety of ways of doing this, but uh, I certainly agree that we need some more uh, someone that's actually invested in this. And so to you know to, to go back to Phil's question uh, with regard to his his. His issue with regard to uh, what do we do to get closure on some of these difficult decisions and difficult questions is we actually actively need someone to go and sit down with the governor sit down with a bunch of people and that's not done through this facilitation process I think you understand that so I think that's something that if you can help suggest that in the time remaining tonight the best way to arrive at that decision I think you will have earned your pay for the evening Thank you. I appreciate that um, very much. The, have we have? I'm going to do my own fact finding here. Have we had discussions with the Virginia Tech and University of Virginia and WMATA? Have there been active, specific discussions between these bodies and their bodies? There have been. Have they been productive? Well, I mean, I guess it depends how you define productive. If you're trying to get, if you're trying, if you're trying to get um, a deal or some immediate resolution, no. I mean, they're institutions. They have different. You talked about timetable. They have a different time horizon than we do, and so I think that's part of the problem right now is that they're on university time, you know, and we're on Falls Church time with the school and, and other needs that are more immediate. So I think that's part of the, the issue we got to work through. That makes sense. And universities, having worked at them for a while, and, and we've done a lot of campus plans, despise nothing more than uncertainty and risk, right? So asking them to invest in a process that is uncertain and risky at this point is, is, a, is a tough sell. If you can frame it in a way of we have lots of potential to do really great things here, but we would do it better with you, and we need to understand what your time horizon is, then at least we know, are we building to a 10-year time horizon or a 15-year time horizon, or is there no partnership possibility at all and we just got to do our own thing? So some of that is, is bodies working with bodies, some of it's people working with people and making sure that all of you have a really good understanding of where all of you are on this issue. Whether it's the governor or it's, it's legislators or it's federal realty trust, which we've done a lot of work with, they, they have a lot of real estate holdings around D.C. that they are developing right now, right? So on paper, this would be a perfect next step for them. I've had no discussions with them about this. I know some of their people have had no discussions of this. But if this isn't seen as a great development opportunity from them and they own the land adjacent, we need to know why, because that's probably why other developers aren't bidding on this, right? There's something in the deal structure that isn't making sense, because on paper it makes sense. Those are the types of questions we haven't asked because we don't have access, but those are the types of questions that I would ask in a very specific way. I know Councilmember Evans came out and addressed a meeting out here at some point. Um, 
I, I know him very well, and he's a very forward-looking type of guy. Metro's also in the middle of the biggest crisis they've ever faced, right? So you can want to do development and then also want to keep your system running, and those may not be on the same timetable, right? But those are the types of questions that need to be asked to the right people in Metro at the right time to figure out if this is even on their radar. I haven't done extensive research on the Metro out here, but from what I have done, the ridership is down pretty significantly, like 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 9,000 to 2,000, some version of that, like a pretty significant decline. So if that is somewhere on a radar screen at Metro, whose is it on and does this make any sense to talk about in context of that? What I think it's really interesting is all of those are really long time horizon discussions that may be way too long for building a school or even doing commercial development, but if we don't have a process for doing them and resolving them at whatever that means, it's going to be one of those things that people can easily say, well, we can't move forward here because we don't know what they want to do. So we almost need to structure kind of concurrent decision making and, and jump in if I'm articulating this right, Sherry, but we almost need to structure, I'm thinking of a couple other projects we've done where you need to structure a series of decisions that all aren't linear, right? There's a decision matrix where this can go on this path, so the grand partnership discussion may be a five to 10 year discussion, and you've got lots of discussions that have to happen over here, but that doesn't mean you can wait five to 10 years to build a school or to do commercial development, but it's ordering them in a way that makes some sense that, that I think is worth some time collectively thinking through. And I think, so one of the things that I think, and various people have talked about it, I think Ms. Oliver's touched on it, Mr. Z's touched on it indirectly, and that is what, what is the size of the bread box for a high school program? A and I think one of the things that would be helpful is what are the various options and what are the, you get some more information about what it would cost out to do a renovation, what it would cost out to do something phased, doesn't have to be down to the nearest cent, but something that will give us an idea of what the relative numbers are. Because I think if we can lay everything out, you know, phased, um, modular, build, all new, and, and get a sense, you know, 40 years, 50 years, then that plays into how long your ground lease is, of course. You know, I don't think anybody here is talking about 150 year uh, school building. Um, I think we're I think 50 is about where we yeah. usually are. But if we could get some idea of, you know, what, what are the various options just so we can have something to put in front of the community. And I think, you know, one of the ideas that I don't think we should rule out is could we not develop on that land and build there um, and have that scenario? Um, maybe we can develop elsewhere. Maybe the land across the street is an option. But, uh, but I think if we could lay all that out in front of ourselves as well as the community, we would have an anchor to start conceptualizing about some of this. Who, who do you have that's providing kind of real estate deal structure cost estimating type stuff? Is that, is that all being done in house or do you have consultants doing that piece? Well, I we think had, there's, uh, you go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, we, had, we hired consultants for part of the process that's been terminated. And so I think we had uh, skilled assistance during that period of time. We got some useful information out of that. At the present, we're reevaluating, and that's why maybe you're here tonight, is for us to figure out a way forward from here. And so, uh, but we did get good information out of the process that's occurred. We had a ULI um, TAP study, technical assistance panel that came to Falls Church. And so we have done some homework, but we don't have an ongoing relationship with an outside consultant at the present. That may be something we'll want to consider going forward. That makes sense, and, and I want to be uh, extremely clear on where our core co competency is. We can't tell you if a $100 million school phased in makes sense or not. That's the, We have lots of partners that do that, and I'm happy to give you some great names, but that's not a core function of what we do. We're, we're, we're the process people that try and see if bodies can get something done, and then we can put a deal together around that, but pricing out a square foot school is something you'd want some additional supplemental support around. Vice Mayor Connolly. Thanks. Uh, can you, Tim, can you scroll back to the game board? I, I like this game board because it hits a lot of the things that we're hitting, but, but not all the things. And part of it is this, the parallel process that you sort of drew out on this one. And as I look at that, I think for us, the preliminary stuff that Ms. Hardy's talking about could be that very first box and 
what can we, the, the real preliminary stuff. But then if we had a game board that kind of split into parallel paths for a while and then came back together, where we're making a decision together and then split into parallel paths a while, as we're thinking about this whole process, then we're able to go back together and apart, together and apart in a real clear way. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's exactly the type of thing that would have to come together around this, and then it would be up to the two bodies to decide kind of what's the level of buy-in that you need from both bodies before you move to the next box, right? So in Dalton's case, they need a board vote on every box, and when they move past it, they've moved past it and they voted on it, and if they want to go back and redo it, it takes a board vote to reopen the process and go back and do that, and that's to try and make sure that we're not having the same discussions over and over again, right? They've also determined, and this is different in every community, that if they get below about a 4-1 vote, they're probably losing the momentum they need to get to the end of that board. So they've made a calculation that 3-2 isn't sustainable to go out to the their community. That's completely different in every community, and I have no opinion on that, but those are the types of things that you can build into a structure. If we get halfway through this and both boards are completely fractured, we're probably not getting to the end. So that's an appropriate place to say, why are we here and why can't we agree to get past box number two? And if we can't, then the rest of these boxes are never going to get to, so we need to legitimately rephrase what we're doing here. And so it's kind of laying it out and then figuring out what your standard is to move forward. Does that make sense? It does. And I like the idea of having a board vote at certain times to to what Mr. Reitinger said. Of you can look at something and say, all right, now we've made a decision on this one or we've addressed this one and we're moving on to the next thing. Right. And we don't need to go back and reinvent that wheel all over again in two years or whenever that is because it's already been looked at and That's really exactly seriously right. and considered. And time horizons become a really relative thing in school systems because you're, you're building for decades and you've been here for decades, right? But the decision points are generally determined by a few different things. It's either determined by facility condition and we can't wait any longer because we need to replace something or in over-enrolled schools. If we don't build, we gotta put trailers out. So there's either that constraint or more often than not, it's the, the political cycle of turnover in boards. That, that drives a lot of this, of okay, we've got a board that's been engaged and we're gonna lose all of those people in two years and then we're gonna start over whether we want to or not. So we've seen that in a lot of different jurisdictions is it's the, the political turnover that kills a process before the process kills a process. And that whether that's helpful or not, that's an, another interesting thing. I would look at how long before you need to do something with your school, yes. how long before you know we don't have the people around the table that have been around the table up to this point. And that's not a good or a bad thing, there's often a, we're resetting and starting over, but then you're starting over, right? It's kind of those two things, and then what are the bond referendum, public financing t constraints around when we would have to back into all of this? That starts to put a time frame together that, that isn't based on opinion, but based on fact. You have to announce a bond referendum by a certain time, like you start backing into it from there, and then that becomes clearer, and you figure out if you can do a deal in that structure or not. Any other? Uh, Mr. Uh, Snyder. So let me, let me try to review some of what I've heard here and let me see if I can help move, uh, move us forward because I think we'd all like to do that. Um, first of all, um, I think we need to get the issues and our needs together and not only the people that are sitting around this table, but I think we need to give the community an opportunity to weigh in so that we don't miss a question that the community is going to keep asking. Um, and, and I have a sense that our community's got some ideas that would be very helpful. So even as I'm going to speak to the two bodies tonight, it's really to give the community an opportunity to participate in putting together what I think needs to be a comprehensive list, perhaps not in order, not regularized, from which you can maybe put together a game board like that. So it seems to me what I've heard is the question of affordability and numbers. Are we really working from the same set of numbers? Karen put out some very good numbers, but uh, I, I think there needs to be a sense of that, as well as some more sophisticated economic modeling. The Mount Daniel question is clearly there. How does that fit on the game board? Um, uh, Justin, I think a minute ago, talked about the school facility. Do we build it all at one time? Is it phased? Is it modular? You know, you asked, I think, a very good set of questions there. Um, the staff is telling us we ought to get busy on zoning and drawing, drawing um, maps. Well, 
my question to that is you can draw all the maps in the world, but if nobody's going to come, so that's a chicken and the egg thing. So the reality is we probably need to do both. Then what consultants do we really need that we don't, we don't have right now? Um, uh, how about what does the PPE tell us? Uh, what are the lessons that we ought to be drawing from that process? Because I think it was an extremely valuable process, um, but it didn't produce a result that the community was expecting, and many of us were, so why not? What does that tell us? Then we have the whole WMATA UVA situation to deal with as well. So what I've tried to do is listen to people and kind of put together. Um, th these are clusters of issues and in some cases questions, but I think unless we get a fulsome list of that, because we are restarting now uh, in a sense, not in one sense restarting, in another sense we're actually moving to another phase, having learned a lot and having progressed so far, we're now, I think, more of in a, pos in a position where we can think about a game board. I'm reluctant to put a bunch of arbitrary decision points there until I know where is the community, what are the questions that they're asking, let's figure out a logical way to move through this and the whole notion is to get as many people on board as possible. So, and we do have an experience. We, we built uh, Mary Ellen Henderson, uh, and I think we should learn from that process as well, which is probably something you guys didn't study up on, but was a very positive process for the San Porta community. We did some sophisticated economic modeling. It wasn't the size, even then, it wasn't the size of the project that this is potentially at the full 112 million. Nonetheless, it was a very significant project for the community. So those were the reactions and trying to listen to, to what people were saying uh, in terms of moving forward. But uh, I, for one, think this has a, been a very valuable discussion. Appreciate you being here and appreciate you guys setting it up. So. Are there other questions or comments? Ms. Oliver? Sure. <coughs> so I'm not sure that we've made any definite decisions tonight. But I think the point that I want to make is I think that we, as our two bodies, need help to get the critical questions that these two bodies have on the table. And I think we need an independent party to do that because I think we need to make sure that everybody gets heard, everything gets captured. Until we have those questions, um, we can't lay out the path forward because those questions will determine to some extent what happens you know if we're not going to do economic development we don't need to zone the land if we are going to do economic development we do need to zone the land so I think the thing that we can do before we have a decision on Mount Daniel is to start to capture those critical questions and and that's what we really need in order to get unstuck and those questions will help us determine what our decision points are going to be going forward or set the stage for the decisions that we'll make in the future. Any other uh, questions? Michael? So to Ms. Oliver's point, should we have a motion to hire process consultant? But yeah, I don't know if, uh, <laughs> I don't know if we should do that right at this moment, but I think that that. Uh, Would that be the next logical next step? Uh, it probably would. I think probably what we have a consensus for, at least what I'm hearing, is that A, we got to get our questions. To get good answers, we need good questions. And I think there have been a lot of questions floating around, and, and I don't know if they're second guessing or whatever you might want to call it, but it seems that we really all haven't been on the same sheet of music even as to the questions we should be asking. And so it seems like the consensus I'm hearing tonight is that's the first step, is to get our questions right. And that may require some assistance in terms of facilitating that, making sure we ask the right questions, we get the right buy-in. Um, but that seems like that's the, the really the issue that we've got to deal with first. And so um, I think this has been a useful discussion to help focus our ideas about how we go forward. And I think actually you're not going to get good answers unless you ask good questions. And I think we've really directed our own process um, in that way. So I think it's been very useful. And, we, and I thank you for help facilitating that, and I think through your own presentation this evening. Um, I'm not sure where this takes us just now. I'm not sure this is the appropriate time to really flush out our, our issues with consultants. I know the city staff would probably like to prepare some additional information for us to consider. At least I'm guessing they would, um, and maybe that would be something for our next meeting to really flush out a little bit more how we might get assistance to go forward. Um, but uh, I guess I would suggest at this point maybe we thank you for your time and your efforts, and I don't know what the next phase of this would be for our conversation. I, we probably moved into our next 
um, portions of our agenda. Is that right, Mr. Shields, or what would you think? Uh, what did you plan? So the next that? phase of our agenda, one thing I will just say, if you read the agenda, what it says is a summary of what we know uh, right now. And I think a lot of what we write, what we, what I was prepared to say that I think we know actually is probably still contentious. And, um, <laughs> and so what I think actually might be more helpful is just to do a quick summary of the resources that we still do have to help us answer these questions. And so really where we ultimately need to move towards is, okay, we've got these resources, we kind of have the brain power, how do we put them in harness to make sure they're answering the right questions in a process that everybody believes in and trusts and, and uh, is orderly. Um, so in terms of the resources that we do have right now, school costing is, is a huge issue. Um, when you get to the question of affordability, it is a feedback loop between what we can afford but also what we will get for those dollar amounts. And if you, if you arrive at what you think you can afford but you actually can't get anything that actually is useful for you, then there needs to be that, uh, that feedback. And, and um, so in terms of school costing, we do have Arcadis. In terms of our financial <coughs> model, uh, we have built a debt service model that came through our evaluation of the proposals. Um, I think that model is, is ready to go, and one of the great liberating things of not having the P3 is that we can take that model out public, and we can work through the assumptions that we use then for debt service. So you plug in your number, um, you can plug in your assumptions for interest rates and these types of things, but it also gives us a real good tool to wrestle with these issues about how can we stretch. We, we do have, uh, we have in terms of the big numbers, we have a, a CIP that has $30 million worth of projects out, outside of the school project. And then this school project is currently in the CIP at $112 million. Um, we have about $9 million in reserves. Um, that includes the $3 million for the parking deck at the library. So if we put that, uh, that's um, uh, potentially can be re-obligated, um, but we have $9 million in cash reserves right now. And so with their debt service modeling, we can see how those reserves can be deployed to um, help with affordability, and then we can also plug in economic development assumptions to, to deal with affordability. Um, we also have our financial advisor, uh, who's been with the city for a very long period of time, Davenport, and they can advise us on, um, on the question of affordability as well. In terms of commercial real estate um, advice, um, Savile Studley has uh, helped us through the evaluation process. Uh, we don't have them under contract right now for our next phase, uh, but they understand this project and I think they're available to us um, as, as needed as we go forward. Um, fiscal impact modeling, of course, we, we have our Tischler advice model um, and that also can be deployed um, uh, specific to any analysis that we need to do. Um, we've got, um, that's a, sort of a quick summary, I think, of the tools that we can use as, as we're putting the questions on the table and then working towards resolution of them. Yes, um, Ms. Oliver and Ms. Hardy. So I guess the question I have is that one of the things I think we've struggled with this process is credibility for some of our consultants and the question of whether or not some consultants just give us the answers they think that we want. And, um, you know, specifically the question of what would, what could we get from a renovation versus a new build? That's, that's been a big issue and it's been something that I've heard a lot of discomfort with the answer that we get from Arcadis because they always work for us and they always, you know, you know so there, there is some sense that perhaps we always get the same answers from the same consultants. What is the potential um, as a part of this process moving forward for getting a second opinion? Maybe not a full, you know, project, but just getting a sense for somebody that works with you know, renovations on a regular basis. Could we get a better number? You know, could we get a better sense for what we might achieve? Um, on the financial modeling, I mean, all of the consultants, they, they are our usual consultants. And so where there's credibility issues, what, what are, what's our potential to do something different? Well, I think that the trust of the information you're getting is, is really key to the decision making. And um, 
so that can be handled in a couple of different ways. One, there could be more um, deeper understanding of what's behind the information that you're getting. So you know, that's one approach. Um, or the question of whether you want to get second opinions. Uh, and then it'll be up to you to evaluate whether it's better or whether it's worse, but it would be a second opinion. So I think either of those could be considered, but I think we would, um, I mean, I think those are things we need to address up front in this planning process. The, the sources of information and the process by which you will get your information uh, to make decisions. I don't have all the answers right now. I mean, I, on the question of the renovation versus new build, I, th I think we did get a second opinion on that recently. That was uh, a little bit, I don't, I don't know if you, if, uh, Dr. Jones, you want to speak about that? I, but I think part of it could be just uh, taking tours up there on the site with experts on hand so you can see and get greater transparency as to what are the issues up there at the school and, and have greater understanding of what the challenges are for a renovation versus a new build. and try to get better informed on it. But yeah, and I, I think we are continuing to work through all, all of those issues. And um, we did have um, one of the consultants some of you have met and met at the City Visioning as well, who works with modular construction, who actually toured the school. I know Mary Beth came along, Lauren Bruce was with us. Um, couldn't be here tonight because he was in Canada, but looking at seeing if he would do a write-up or something to the nature of what he saw by looking in the ceiling, going in and looking at the boilers. So we're, we're doing some of that, and I'm certainly will continue to, to work to get more outreach. Um, I think the big thing, too, also about renovation that a lot of people, you know, there are a couple of different components. When you say renovation, what does that mean? So, again, it comes back to the whole question component. Um, are we talking about a gut renovation of the building, which is what everyone will tell us pretty much that walks through it uh, the wiring is you know old everything in it is old so and are you just talking about then staying with a 20th century design building so we're going to leave the walls where they are you know rip everything you can out all the ceilings or are we talking about having a 21st century which is what the new program actually has in it which has steam labs and you know collaboration areas and all of the things that our teachers and our students have weighed in and say and say are very important <coughs> for instruction for the 21st century so what kind of renovation are we willing to live with um, so that's I mean that's a whole different question the other the other piece is a lot of people forget it's not just a renovation right now we are at capacity today that's today and especially now that we just lost all six of our trailer classrooms we are at capacity so you know we have to look at this from a also an expansion and a lot of people don't realize I mean, that's new construction so you can't just do the renovation but I'll continue to, to work with different people and we can get more uh, consultants to look at and give us those numbers but because it's based on you know, square footage pricing and what's in the market, I, you know, I don't think we'll see radical changes, which I think is what you're saying as you look around the country, it depends on the economy, you know, and where you live and basically the price per square foot. Also, in addition to that, um, in addition to that, I, I mean, we have to live with the existing footprint too, so that would limit the development on on Lee Highway, so I, or, I'm sorry, Leesburg Pike. Um, if there is a, a eventually development there, you have to consider like the, the, the school's going to be gutted and just renovated. It's not going to be moved. It's still going to it's still going to border um, Leesburg Pike, which is I think when we when the consultants came in here, they told us that was that's more prime real estate for businesses. Um, because they've, have, they've got more exposure to traffic than if they're set further behind the school. Sorry. Thank you. I had two thoughts. Um, we, well, going back to the affordability question, and I think uh, Mr. Shields had mentioned kind of plugging in kind of economic development into the what can we afford model. I think the other thing we've struggled with that we don't really have clarity on is what kind of economic development and how much revenue does that generate and having community dialogue on it, seeing what the market will produce. I know a lot of us would love to see something more ambitious than the mixed use development. So while we're in this interim phase, whether we call it precursor or waiting for Matt Daniel, whatever we call it, is can we informally shop the site, you know, enlist the help of the EDA, put feelers out in the community to figure out, you know, are you gonna produce more mixed use development if we you know, put an RFP out there again, 
or is there something more innovative out there? And what does that generate in terms of economic revenue? And if that's a lower tax revenue, you know, that needs to be a community dialogue. Would you be willing to have a higher tax rate, but you might get a sportsplex or a hotel, or do you want more apartments, but that means a lower tax rate? And that dialogue, I think, needs to happen as part of those that option set. So that's something I'd like to see happen as kind of the precursor step, just to know what the market might generate. And maybe the answer is no. Maybe the mar- answer is no, we only want to produce mixed-use development there, but that needs to be a, an explicit decision and discussion with the community. Um, the second thought I have is, I guess, in the interim, given how challenging it's been to get the two bodies together over the summer and to be able to move the ball forward, is does it make sense to reconstitute kind of a smaller version of the groups, whether we call it steering committee? I guess there used to be a steering committee last year but get the group together in some smaller fashion to put together that list of questions while we await the Mount Daniel decision. Because I feel like tonight's probably not the right form to have this working group or work session to lay out all the questions, but maybe a subset of the two bodies can work with staff on what those questions are, what's the precursor list, what goes on the game board, or whatever we end up calling it. Um, So I propose we do something like that so that we don't lose momentum and try to get the two bodies together. You know, it takes probably another two months to get everyone back together again outside of a regular schedule. Mr. Z? I totally agree with uh, what Ms. Hardy said and, and, and uh, the way she, uh, she expressed it. I, and I think that perhaps uh, uh, getting the questions that, and uh, the question set to enable us to make the difficult decisions, uh, uh, potentially uh, we could do it uh, several ways. We could reconstitute a, a board of a small group of the officials that we have around the table or, or this might be something appropriate for the consultant has to follow on so they can give clarity and coherence to the, the questions and issues that we're expressing uh, that seems to be their skill set and process so uh, I for one would be in favor of, uh, of uh, retaining uh, link strategic partners to uh, to tease those questions out and that may even be acceptable to Ms. Gill with respect to the larger issue of, you know, Mount Daniel tanks, then we have an entirely different animal to deal with. Uh, I would like to ask, and hopefully it's not out of left field, that before these guys leave tonight that uh, they can walk us through um, what things are required and what kinds of expectations we should have if we decide to embark on a worldwide um, international design competition, what would it cost in terms of time, effort, resource, uh, what's expected of us, what's expected of the community. Because up to now, we've just gone down one very narrow lane here, one very narrow swim lane, which, uh, you know, we went dark, threw something out there, and, you know, maybe we just didn't have the right kind of bait. So, you know, what? maybe this would compel um, a much better look that draws on the experience of the uh, built environment specialists around the world. Absolutely. Good for me. I've given you enough time to formulate an answer at this point. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so design competitions take lots of different forms. In Arlington's case, and I don't, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, top of my head, but we can get them. They, they budgeted to allow three design firms to be paid to prepare bids. So they, they solicited applications from firms who wanted to be part of the design competition they then picked three and then gave them a budget to go do their design work to come back so that's how they handled it there it depends on how valuable the site is seen by the market sometimes design competitions can work without a budget attached to them more often than not the firms that are bidding are going to want some honorarium to spend their time preparing design models etc and then depending on how it moves forward in this case sherry i'm trying to remember this one did they move they had all three and then they moved to one or did they limit it to two and then to one? Well, they had three different sites. Right. So they all moved together and then there was a sort of selection of one site in that process. Right. But as a result, three was a good example right. of one of the alternative sites that wasn't chosen for the middle school. It's now moving forward to the elementary school two years later. So right. the, the work was not, lo- it wasn't lost work. It just transformed into a different, a different pro- Into a different project. Right. Does that help? Yes, thank you. I'm just a little bit disappointed. I thought it was more of a more of an open canvas uh, kind of uh, 
uh, invitation. But it, it can be. So Gallaudet University just ran a great design competition um, to develop a really neat project on their building, on, on their campus. And they ran an international design competition, and they, they had staff assigned to it and architecture students who put this together and ran a really robust campaign that intentionally went out and said, we want developers of different sizes. So in that competition, they said, we want a couple international designers, we want a couple local designers, we want a couple architects who've not done this size building before, but need an entree into doing this. So they were taking a very learning-based model to it. So I've seen them done. Are there other models you've seen? Now, I was just going to Gallaudet, again, took a much more aggressive and, a, a, and, a, and a, a broader view, I think more along the lines of probably what you're envisioning. And so that would be a good model for us to look to if that's something that you'd want to pursue further. Well, thank you for that, because I, uh, I know that uh, um, we have Virginia Tech, which has their urban design right. uh, studio just up the street here, and, and they would be an invaluable asset uh, to help us uh, uh, bring this about if we decide to go down that path, or at least inform the process. That's just my question. Thank you. Vice Mayor Connolly. Uh, now I'm going to show my ignorance based upon Mr. Z's question. He's talking about international design competition. How dissimilar is that to the PPEA process where you just get bids and on the project? Yeah, so the idea behind the PPE process, you put out a very specific RFP and you say build to this specification and then you see if you like what you get and you pick one of them and go from there. Generally in a design competition, it's just that, it's a competition. So generally the parameters aren't quite as strict up front because you're trying to see what is out there that we couldn't have possibly asked for yet. That's generally the difference. If you know exactly what you want and it has to be built to this specification, a design competition really isn't the way to do that. You're gonna say I want 10 stories, I want it to look like this. If you say, I have this many acres and I don't know what fits here. We need to put you know, 800 kids on a site that's two and a half acres, what can fit? Then a design competition becomes an innovative way of trying to get people to do that. The, the kind of other alternative is actually what Dalton's doing at the end of this month down in, in, in um, Dalton. The end of August, they're bringing in um, DLR Group, which is the largest provider of K-12 education architecture in the world. They've done $75 billion worth of school construction projects. They're bringing Dalton in for a three-day charrette where the architects are coming in for three days to sit with the superintendent, the mayor, the head of the chamber, the head of the university, and they're running a three-day charrette where they're in a room designing what a downtown would look like modeled around a school. Um, it's not a huge budget, and, and they found an architect who wanted to do work in Georgia, and they, they used this as an opportunity. But there are lots of different models like that that depend on where you are in the process. Okay, any other questions? Thank you for that. Oh, I'm sorry, Phil. It, it's not actually a question. I just wanted to make sure it didn't get lost in the permits. I agree very much with Ms. Hardy and Mr. Z that a smaller group to at least do options development would be a valuable thing. I understand that there have been problems before about assigning responsibilities to a group that then bring it back to the larger body that doesn't agree with what the smaller group does. But if you're focusing on things like developing questions or options and alternatives and possible partnerships, you're not making decisions. That feels, feels to me like something that could be um, more efficiently done by a smaller group that could involve as well groups like the Planning Commission. Okay, are any other thoughts on that idea? Yeah, I'm, I agree with um, with Ms. Hardy and Ms. Rettinger on, on those points. I, I really, and I, I particularly like what Ms. Hardy said about having um, an economic development um, study done of what is feasible up at that site. I, it, it would be nice to have that information in advance, and um, so when the time comes to discuss it, we have the numbers in front of us. But I really also like the idea of your steering committee um, it, it just makes more sense with all of us sitting around these tables and everybody, it, it just, it's, it's a long process. And I think um, it's, it's sort of a Jiminy Cooks, Will the Broth kind of thing. I think if we have selected members of each of our, our, um, our bodies to make you know decisions, not big decisions, but things like coming up with the, the questions, it just makes the most logical sense and the most efficient use of our time. Okay, is there a consensus to reconstitute a well, steering committee uh, of some flavor or the other? I, I would ask a, a, a preliminary question, and that is, do people here 
have a comfort level with the costs of the various options for a school program. For what we've seen for the estimates for the costs of the various renovation, new build, et cetera. Is there a, that comfort level here? I'm not so, sensing that there is, but I That um, was kind of a rhetorical question. Okay. Um, I said there isn't. Yeah. I think you got it. Because, uh, you know, everything, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned if we, I, I think the economic development study is important, but I think everything flows from the menu of what the options are. And unless and until we know what that menu looks like, then I think we'll be spinning our wheels again. So my suggestion to this group now would be, if there isn't that comfort level, let's get the cost estimates for the various scenarios. And I think the small group could run up a list of the scenarios so that we can then as, a, as bodies look this over and, and put that stake in the ground so that then we'll start to have a better sense of what is the option that at least at first blush makes the most sense so then we can start to do things that logically flow from that consensus option because otherwise I, I think we're going to have a lot of things sliding around without an anchor so that would be a we'll get the small group to do that and b that should be the first order of business and does that make sense mm -hmm. so i might suggest a variation on that which is i think what you've just suggested the question you just suggested is a critical question but there i think there may be others as well that are precatory in other words that may be not be question one that may be question one b or question two and so to me it seems like we ought to take a step back from your question and really come up with all the questions that we want to ask and then be able to put them in an order that they need to be answered. That may in fact be question one, but I don't think we've done enough due diligence to really know whether that's the first question to be asked. And maybe but the question has to do with enrollment. Maybe someone says, well, you're asking the wrong question. If the enrollment number is not right, then maybe we don't need to do a renovation of this sort. And the, the number you cost estimate you just got is not accurate based on because it's not based on accurate information with respect to enrollment. It may in fact be the first question, but I guess I'm not comfortable tonight saying that's question number one. I think probably the better question would be what are our questions? And once we get them all on the table, then we can prioritize and put them on a game board or whatever you might want to call a flow chart or how to answer those questions. But I think that's an absolute absolutely critical question I'm just not sure I'm comfortable at this point saying that's question number one and from when from whence everything begins and so I guess I would suggest us taking a step backwards and trying to figure out what are all the questions that we think are the critical questions to be asked and then figuring out how those need to be answered to lead us forward but I'd certainly be welcome or open to hearing what other folks have to say as well but that's that's sort of where I stand on that I would agree with that I mean, I think it's obviously important to know uh, information of the sort that Justin suggested, but, you know, that's just part of the puzzle. I mean, you can't really make a intelligent decision about what you can afford until you know what you need and, to some degree, at least what you can earn uh, through economic development. So, I mean, there's just no way that we're going to get around having to have some of that kind of information before we can, you know, proceed, I don't think. Other folks, other comments? Um, yes, I do. Um, I, I, I mean, ultimately, what we want to come to is what Justin said. We have to come to some kind of agreement on what, how much money we want to spend. But like, but like what you said, uh, Mayor, we can't come to that agreement until we know what what our income possibilities are. That would include economic development. It would inc include, you know, um, uh, among other things. Um, so, I th I think that if we had a the subcommittee to come up with those small questions leading up to the big question, um, as as far as affordability goes, I think that makes the most sense. Like get all that legwork done. We got to know. What things are going to cost us? We got to know what things, what kind of income we're going to generate, to in order to get a reasonable idea of what we can afford. So I, I sort of agree with both of you, but um, yeah, I, I, I mean, point. I guess with respect to the enrollment projections, I, I, I think they're they are what they are. We've got Weldon Cooper. We've got the other ones. I, we can 
revisit those, I think they'll be fairly fixed. Well, I guess um, what I would say as to that, and um, not to interrupt, but just that, for example, economic development. Economic development impacts the number of kids that are going to be here. In other words, if we, you say you didn't, your numbers didn't have any economic development built in, right? The numbers you came up with. Well, it's, yeah, we, um, we do have the chart that has the economic development, the one I shared with City Council not too long ago, that has it built in, that, but we have plugged that in with our own model working with city staff. Davenport, I think, does that, or Tischler Vice, um, but it's not built into that 1,200. That 1,200 student number, and again, it's being conservative, so we don't build a high school that's too big, is strictly the Weldon Cooper number. But if we continue to have development um, like the one on West and Broad, you know, and down where the Applebee's are, that will continue to impact that number over the next decade, 15, 20 years. Well, that's why I think it's a relevant consideration, because I don't think the city is going to stop with new development. Yeah, and how it looks remains to be seen, but I, I feel fairly confident we're going to continue down the path of trying to promote economic development. So I think that could impact the school we may build. And so I, I think, and I'm not, I, want, I don't want to get in the weeds of yeah. what questions we need to ask, but I do think there are questions beyond that question, which is a critical question that we should be asking and lay them on the table and figure out what is the proper flow path, which goes first. Maybe that's number one, but maybe it's number one B or one C. So anyway, Michael? Aren't we drifting into what, we sh what the consultant should be doing right now? That's why we need a consultant. Which is why we should terminate this discussion and <laughs> let them do their job. What do you think, Lawrence? <laughs> yes, sir, Karen Oliver. So I, I think that where, where we want to get with the preliminary work that we do is we want to understand the questions that we want to ask, and we need to have the simple version of the answers that we all agreed to commit to. Because the problem we've had is we've had these conversations, and there's a range of answers, and everybody uses the one they like. So we need as a body, the decision point then has to be that we are going to work with this budget or in this budget range or we're going to work in this enrollment range or we're going to answer the questions but we need to be able to summarize the answers to the questions. And I know I've heard a lot of people say, oh, we really need to understand the economic development. Personally, I'm happy to use the assumption that it'll be 40 million plus or minus 20 million but like for purposes of going forward, you know, I don't think you need to know whether it's forty million one hundred and twenty-seven thousand and thirty-seven cents. You just need a range. We need a range that, of assumptions that we're willing to work in, and to get that range of answers, we need the questions framed. Well, I, I do agree that the perfect is the enemy of the good on this. I mean, we can again. I think we should revisit it, but I, I think so much flows from that. Um, so you know, let's take the time and, and look at that. But I think. Should we set a, do we want to have some notional schedule for when we'll have these questions set forth so we can start to get them answered? That's, oh, great. That's a great question that you just asked. And let me just channel some Michael and Kuma here, uh, which is that okay. if he were speaking, he would say there's not much we can, we can do until we figure out what happens to Mount Daniel. So I think that needs to factor into any decision with regard to what we do between now and the end of September. Get that right? thank, thank you, Michael. <laughs> so how about this as a suggestion? I think there's a consensus that, I'm sorry, go ahead, Phil. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to be clear about one very short thing, which is I don't think a small working group and a consultant are mutually exclusive alternatives. I would support both of those two things at the same time. So how about this as a, as a suggestion? I think there's a consensus that we need to take a step back and a ask basic questions and get answers to basic questions before we can figure out where to proceed, how we're gonna proceed. Is that, would that be a fair statement mm -hmm. from everyone? And so I think the question is how do we get the questions we want on the table in a way that they can be answered in an effective way and move forward. And it seems to me that's our first challenge right now is to get the questions out so that we can structure our discussion and, dis and structure our analysis and, and Way to basically way to proceed and engage the community. And so I guess to me that's sort of the first step we're faced with right now. And then the question is, how do we do that? Do, do we do that on our own with internal staff? Do we hire a consultant? If we hire a consultant, what's the scope of their work? And it seems to me that's kind of where we are right now. 
And so um, I don't know if there's a consensus about how we might approach the question of getting questions, but it seems to me that's sort of where we are right now. <laughs> and um, I think that's sort of the first question that needs to be answered is how we get answers, how we get questions that we might get answers from. And Mr. Shields, do you have any thoughts? Well, I, th I think that um, if we hire the consultant, that would be one of their tasks because they do take t uh, stakeholder interviews and they can get these questions. They can pull them out of you and sort of get, get, that, um, get that going. I think one way we could do it is if, if we don't want to tonight appoint like a permanent smaller group, we could appoint a smaller group that is really the steering committee to get ready for our next meeting to relaunch um, the process. And, um, and so that might be a, basically a month. Mount Daniel will be taken care of in uh, the decisions in late September. Uh, so that next meeting would be, I think we could say it would be after that. So late September, get together early October, um, have a small group from the two bodies that of no more than four who will work with staff, work with the consultant, get things teed up for our next meeting. I, the, the only thing, uh, I'll, I'll continue to push on this a little bit because, you know, in the various polls that we've done of the community and the school board, 70% of the respondents indicate some level of support for proceeding with a high school. A and I think we're bleeding time. And there the, this, this threshold issue, uh, I, I mean, I don't think the Mount Daniel decision will change what the cost of the various high school options will be. It may complicate the landscape, but I'm, I'm deeply concerned that we're just hemorrhaging time right now. And I think there is stuff we can do concurrently, even as we wait for some of these other processes to work themselves out. Um, and, and I think, you know, one of the foundational things is it may not be 1,200, it may be 1,300, but, but let's get some marker so that we can start to work this because, you know, now we're talking six weeks until we start to get going. So I, I think we can work some stuff in parallel and yet make allowance for developments that have come down the pike on, on other projects. So we can wait, but there, there will be costs to that. Mr. Ancoum. I mean, I'm, I'll make myself available to talk to them so they can start pulling the questions from the 14 of us, but I don't know what we're waiting for. Does this become easier if we leave? No. I'm serious. Like, does it no, 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 it doesn't. Okay. I, I think we, I think we, 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 yeah, I agree with you, Justin. Time is of the essence, but we're staring at the solution in the face. Let's get them in a room. I'll make myself available tomorrow, next week, whenever. They can ask me all the questions. They can ask all 14 of us the questions. Before we get the, the Mount Daniel decision, would have, he could, in two weeks, he'd have a presentation with all the lines of questions and every and we can move this forward very quickly i, I don't see why we have to go into say, october f to, to get answers for this uh the schedule that the manager outlined would be satisfactory to me i think the mount daniel question is not only a question of numbers uh, but it's a question of community confidence I don't know quite how to put this delicately, but I think there will be more confidence in whatever process that we undertake for the high school if it's done in reference to whatever happens at Mount Daniel. I think what you hear the people in the community saying is that, you know, we're going off in a lot of different directions here, and we need to convey a sense that we are moving along a linear path, and the first thing that needs to be checked off is the Mount Daniel decision then I hope the confidence of the community will be greater that we will be able to proceed on the high school. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand, um, Mr. Duncan, and I, I agree, but I think w why can't we begin our process now? Uh, um, like Mr. Castillo said, we are, we are bleeding time. Like, I don't see why we can't start the questioning process. And with that, um, um, would you be able to explain to us how that works? How they would, how they would, uh, would they interview us individually or as a group? Well, um, let me just clarify a point. I'm not in envisioning that anything stops between now and the next meeting. I think a, a lot of things will get done between now and the next meeting. I just don't know that it, it's necessary for the, all the two boards to get together um, prior to then. Um, so I just wanted to make that clarification. 
Um, do you want to speak to that in terms of how you typically would, would, would start a process like this? Yeah, so in, anytime we work in a new community, we would do what we call a stakeholder audit, which we come up with very specific questions based on what we've heard here tonight and a bunch of other stuff to try and make sure we hear from each person where your decision points are. It'll be things like, where did the last process fall apart? Where do you think opportunities are? Is there a number that you won't surpass? What's your constituency need? It'll be things like that. We can do them over the phone, which is generally easy. The in input is generally a little bit better in person. Uh, you generally want to do that in a number that doesn't trigger everyone having to be in a big public meeting, so figuring out how you want to do all of that, but it would be either individual or two-on-two or -two discussions where we can get as much feedback as possible. Our job is then to document all of that and to say, okay, we're hearing the same thing from a lot of people, and there are some outliers here. Let's generally rewrite a report back that doesn't include names at that point. It says, here are all the issues we heard, um, because it's not about calling people out. It's, here are the themes. Then when we come back and meet with the board, we can say, okay, you guys are on the same page or you're not. Here are the decisions that need to be made in what order based on what we're hearing, and then you structure a process from that. But it's a stakeholder audit process. We've had really good luck in a few communities recently of not limiting that to the boards. There's generally the handful of five to ten other people that are pointed out to us as key stakeholders in this process, whether that's university officials, whether it's planning officials, whether it's civic leaders, just people who would have an opinion on the broader questions are generally helpful to throw into that mix as well. Mr. Mayor, I, I, I guess um, what I've heard concerns me a little bit because we've had a couple years of working through this process. We, we, we all have a pretty good sense about what our questions are. We need to give the community an opportunity to input so that they're part of the small group process so we get the questions. I don't see going through a highly expensive consultant driven, this is the, you know, this is the formula we go through. I think we need to take advantage of what we've done and move forward. There may be a role for a consultant, this one or another one in terms of how we take these questions and put them into a logical path, that may be very helpful. But I don't want to repeat, uh, you know, what is a formulaic process because we've, we've spent a lot of time at this. I think we need to tap into that, and I think we need to tap into the community. The community has been following this. They've got a lot of ideas. Let's get it together and move forward during this period of time, and I think we can do it. Thank you. Other comments? Ms. Hardy? I was just going to add that while I think the answers to the questions could change depending on the Mount Daniel outcome, the questions themselves I don't think change. And so I think it's important in the next month or whatever, I think four or six of us could just get together in a room and throw up a bunch of questions and do a brain dump of here are all the things I think we need to solve, whether we engage consultants in at that point. Um, I'm indifferent to that, but I think all of us have the questions. We've been thinking about these for eight months, sometimes maybe three years. So I think it's just worthwhile to just do that brain dump and get it on paper and say, here's what we need to solve. And we probably need help organizing how to solve it and where all the interdependencies are. But I think all of us are feeling the need to want to move this forward. I don't think necessarily we need to wait for Mount Daniel, because again, I think the questions don't change. I think the answers change. Um, so I think we can do that in parallel while we wait for the Mount Daniel outcome. I, I do think that we should do more than just a group of four people doing a lot of questions, because I think there are 14 16 people sitting around the table right now that have questions, there are people in the audience. So if you just have four people in a room doing that, there are a lot of other questions that get lost. So I do see a value in talking to people individually or in groups of two just to make sure you get everything from everybody to make sh and, and other people who aren't sitting at this table. Other thoughts? Mr. Webb? And I would agree with that. Um, I think to some degree the public has been engaged because with the the numerous um, projects pro, um, that we've had up at the school of uh, visioning, they've given there a, a ton of input of facilities and what should be there, what shouldn't be there, what they'd like to see on the property. So I think they've all had a role in this, but I think uh, bringing a, a smaller group of us together and doing that questioning, because I think an outside person asking the questions may elicit a different answer or at least get us to a different point than where we are now. because. We're all sitting here and we're, again, back to a couple months ago of spinning our wheels and not getting anything accomplished, but just asking the same questions over and over again and giving the same answer. So I do think there is there is some level of, of usefulness of having an outside independent person kind of helping us get through this. And the questions and things, those things are not going to change based on 
you know, what happens at Mount Daniels, the ultimate, what we do beyond that will. But I think the longer and longer we keep pushing this off, we're not going to get anything accomplished and we're going to be sitting in the same spot 10 years from now. Can, um, can we all like agree to maybe get a small group together to distill the questions into something reasonable that we can start with? And it doesn't have to be like not small, like I mean like four, maybe four from each of us and a starting as a starting point. I mean, I feel like we're not starting anything. <laughs> and it's it's really frustrating. And I, I just I, I, I think if we did have like just a like a steering committee just to develop these questions just from our bodies at, at this point. And then because to to engage the public, uh, you know, that's that's a big process. But we gotta start somewhere and we gotta at least figure out what questions we want answered and what's important to us to know, what knowledge we need to know to move forward. We don't have that right now. And I know it's like, it's gonna work, probably work like a flow chart, um, but you know, whatever, I, I think we are all sitting around talking, this is not the first time we've done this, right? This is not, um, I think if we just have you know, two, a small steering committee and, and start, start on these questions and let's get these questions on paper Let's figure out what we want to know, and, and and what we and we want, once we know, want to know, you know, we 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 have an idea of what we want to find out, then we can go about and do that. But right now, we're not finding anything out that really is, you know, it's concrete. Everything's so nebulous right now. Well, I, I would maybe channel um, our our visitors, and and maybe we can break things into factual foundations. That if, as Ms. Hardy said, if the facts, the, the questions may not change, whoops, Daisy. Um, you know, if there are factual things where we can proceed now, let's try to do that. I think Dr. Jones has something to weigh in on. Well, I just, I mean, I think I said it very early on in the process, I think we need a consultant. And, you know, I've had meetings with some of the school board members over the, the last week. We're just having our individual meetings. And one thing that has resonated is that last year was exhausting for the school board. And I would probably think for the city council, we met over 50 times last year. And just as a reminder in this process, you know, we first started working on this really real hard work, 2009, kind of 2011, and we had over $200,000 in plans that we weren't able to utilize. We started up again in 2012, and the school board really was very thoughtful, did a lot of work. We stopped because of the water deal, which we had to. We started again in 2014, and every time we've used the same process, which has been kind of this committee structure, but I think what happens is we don't, kind of what Mary Beth was saying, get everybody's voice when we have committee structures, and then we get thrown back into the same process, and I would really advocate, and I don't know if Wyatt, you know, I can't speak for him, but I think I think we need a consultant because before we came tonight we have spent quite a few hours in meetings with these consultants in preparation for tonight and we've heard all of your questions and thought we had really shared a lot of them the questions with them but I think it, for people to feel heard we need to whether it's this firm or a different firm let's hi, let's get somebody engaged that can make personal phone calls and really wide outreach and hear from everybody and I just think it'll be so much more productive because committee structure has not worked for us um, Ms. Gill? No, I'll just quickly agree with Dr. Jones. I think that this meeting shows the need, our need for a facilitator and someone to put parameters around our discussions and guide our discussions and force us into answers and checking off boxes and moving along the path because I don't think we're getting anywhere with this. I mean, I've been in this meeting like 10 times already since I was elected. So. Well, I, I would say, first of all, I don't, I'm not sure that there isn't a role for a small committee. This group is too big to meet with regularity and get things done, in my opinion. It doesn't mean the small committee makes all the decisions or does all the work, but I think there's certainly a role for a smaller body than this to get together and, and move the ball, advance the ball. Um, that being said, um, I think there is certainly, um, if not a consensus, a certainly a, a fair amount of people will want to explore the idea of using a consultant. And so maybe I could ask Mr. Shields and Dr. Jones to give some consideration of how that procurement might work. In other words, um, uh, just maybe cost, some basic cost numbers, some general ideas about how it might take place, what that consultant might do, and just give us some more ideas for us to figure out if that's the right way to go forward. 
it seems like there's certainly consensus to move down that path or consideration down that path. But I think it'd be good to have more information. I, or at least I think some of us would like to know more about the cost and what a consultant might do and might not do so that we're fully informed before we go down that path. I, Ms. Olive? I would just like to point out that this body doesn't meet again until after Labor Day. And if that means that we don't start the process until after Labor Day, I find that extremely frustrating. Um, I, I don't know whether Mr. Shields, whether you and Dr. Jones have any information to give us or any sense of parameters, but if we have that, it would be helpful because I think if we could move forward tonight in some small way, I think this would be a good thing. And I think Dr. Jones captured it perfectly saying this committee structure has not worked. Can we just show by a uh, vote of a uh, show of hands how many of us want this uh, consultant? Well, uh, consultant the, the, to do. To, I mean, to, how many to, of us want a proposal about what a consultant could do? I mean, do we know what our scope no, no, no. is? Do we know what how our many? How is? many of us? How many of us sitting here now would like to move forward with the consultant to start asking questions right away, subject to a day or two where they propose a quote and we get something? But to to piggyback on what Miss Oliver is saying move forward I think we all want to make sure that all procurement rules are followed and so I <laughs> that's that's why and 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 dr. Jones's job they'll take care of it I believe that that they will but I'm saying the point is we every time we're forced we're asked to take a breather or think about something it's another quarter what we can do is uh, we can share the information the proposal that we've received and um, get a note out to the two bodies about the procurement process we do think that there's a way forward um, and so I think what would be um, it, it would also in terms of the dollar amount it would be below the thresholds that are needed for formal uh, action by our, our elected bodies per our existing procurement rules so I think we would have the ability, if there was consensus, to, to move forward. And we can get that information out to you all as a follow-up um, meeting. If there's consensus to proceed, then we'll do that. And we can do this by e-vote? Uh, no, we're not going to call it that. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, there, there's Talk a, to uh, Mr. Horn after uh, the meeting. Yeah. Um, but, but you all, uh, um, you know, what we've had tonight is an introduction and a discussion of what this process might look forward. So um, I think a key thing for us is we need to know if we're going to move forward with the consultant that there was support of the elected bodies for that type of process. And, um, and so I think we've gotten good feedback on that tonight. I don't think it's appropriate necessarily to make that decision tonight, uh, but we can get you, get, you, get you the contract, and then we can proceed administratively uh, from that. Ms. Hardy? So clearly we need to decide how much, we need to know how much it costs to decide whether we're going to move forward. I guess the other thing that we would be nice to make progress on is whether we have consensus to have some sort of steering committee, because I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I don't think just because you have a consultant means you can't get the smaller group together to work with a consultant more closely. And so is there consensus to do that? And if so, can we draw names out of a hat or say who's not it? Just make some decision? Well, right. Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm not going to volunteer to be a member of that small group. <laughs> Just want to make it very clear here, right off the bat. Uh, uh, and therefore, really, I mean, what appeals to me the most about a consulting approach, and I, I agree with the superintendent and everybody who has spoken for it, I'm sensitive to the Mr. Schneider's concerns about, you know, <laughs> uh, going off and spending money on a consultant when most people in the community pretty well think that we've consulted this thing, you know, very thoroughly and have spent a lot of taxpayer money doing it and and I think again we have a case to make to, to do the process that we now want to do and I think it would help that case if if we uh, engage this consultant in a in a very deliberate and transparent manner uh, I would prefer that we do it at a public meeting where we cast a vote uh, so that anybody who didn't like the consultant could say yeah, I don't want to do that I mean I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with uh, although I understand that the process you outlined it's below the threshold I understand that the process that the manager outlines is is technically legal obviously but again I am trying to sell this what is the goal of this process the goal of this process is at the end to obtain a majority of the community that will vote in favor of a referendum 
to spend a big old bunch of money. And so to me, that process of, you know, winning over people begins anew now, today. And, and uh, one of the appealing elements of having a consultant engage in the process that you described to me was that you, in fact, do a pretty a thorough stakeholder audit and that you actually talk to each one of us and you talk to the EDA and you talk to the Planning Commission and most importantly, you talk to Virginia Tech UVA, you talk to WMATA, and you talk to Fairfax County. Um, if the consulting process that is being described uh, can achieve all of that and get that done by the 1st of October, I, I think that's terrific good progress. We'll know then where we are on Mount Daniel, and you will have conducted this very thorough stakeholder audit uh, with the authority of a vote, I think, I would suggest, I would hope, from both chambers, uh, from both bodies, uh, early in September. Other, Ms. Oliver? I, I think that what I sense people are interested in doing is moving forward relatively quickly with the first stage of the process, capturing the questions. That doesn't necessarily mean the full stakeholder involvement, but it does mean capturing the key questions and decisions that these bodies need to resolve to move forward with some input from a handful of independent other parties that might be interested. The Falls Church way could be, say, could be to say, hey, if you want to put input into the questions, put your name in the hat and we'll try to get to everybody in the time period all allotted. But if, if we, I think we may have agreement on a desire to move forward with starting the process of getting those questions listed. Okay. Um, we probably should try to wrap up this discussion. Mr. Castillo, I, 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 well, I, my sense is that Mr. Shields and Dr. Jones have a lot of work to do on this issue of what a consulting agreement would look like. From what it sounds like, to me, the bodies would like to not have that go into effect without further consultations. Um, with respect to the subcommittee idea, I, I, I would suggest that we see what the consulting scenario looks like and get a sense from Dr. Jones and Mr. Shields about what their recommendations are. My personal feeling, having gone through the process of the steering committee, is that existed to validate the concept of using development to help finance a high school. Um, if we can't all come together for a project of this magnitude, I, I don't know what, when else we would. So my strong feeling would be that we should, um, if we do any smaller group, be for an extraordinarily limited purpose, because I think we, we will have a faster, better result if we all stay engaged. Um, so that's, that's kind of my sense here is that we should let, uh, I don't think we should make this decision too quickly and there's, there's scope and work to do on that. So let's, let's see what they come up with. Mr. Snyder. Okay. So my one cent, um, um, I, I, I don't, I, if, if this consultant contract is not done really well, we're going to waste tens of thousands of dollars, a consultant running around gathering the information we already know and gathering the questions we already know. So I, if we do a consult, if we use a consultant, I would like that consultant to take the questions and begin to formulate based upon other projects how we move forward and alternatives and how we address these. I agree we should have a smaller group. I'm willing to volunteer if people want me to. Um, but I think we ought to have a smaller group. I, we ought to gather those questions. We ought to give the community an opportunity, send your questions in, refer to what you previously sent, whatever. So we've got it all. And then the smaller group formulates the questions with a little bit of light consultant help. But again, I don't favor paying a consultant to interview me for half an hour. I think that's a huge waste of money, frankly. And most people would agree with that. In fact, 20 minutes would be a waste of time. So, but in any event, um, that's the way I would envision going forward um, in, in combining those two factors. Mayor, I thought we had closure. Uh, you know, I, I urge that we just proceed down the path where I see a whole bunch of virtual thumbs up and adjourn this meeting. I don't know that we need to stand up a small 
group tonight, which is what I think I heard Mr. Castillo say. And if that's what you said, thank you. I agree with you. I other, think that's what I said. Other <laughs> comments? Dave, I'm happy to spend half an hour with you. I just want to let you know that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, right, Ms. Oliver. I, I just want to say that I agree with Mr. Castillo. I don't see the purpose of, I don't see the benefit of having a small group. This is a really big decision that all of these bodies need to be fully engaged in. We can't always expect 100% attendance. If you can't make a meeting that's scheduled and you've got enough notice on it, then you have to send your comments in in advance. You have to send your comments in in arrears. You know, we all have a responsibility to be participating. I think what a consultant gives us, Mr. Snyder, that we don't have in a small group is an independent, trustworthy, neutral party. Everybody at this table has an opinion. Mm -hmm. They don't agree. We need an independent, neutral party to help us figure out where we have agreement and where we need to reach agreement. That's what an external party will do. All right, any other comments as we try to wrap the, this the, conversation The school up? board's been awfully quiet. I mean, do we have <laughs> onset of meeting fatigue here? I think the decision, the, the decision, the, tizen, the decision would be that we'll get scope and cost estimates and timelines from Mr. Shields and yeah. Dr. Jones mm -hmm. about an engagement. Um, it, it sounds as if we have some time. Um, I don't know how, what, what your time frame would be for de delivering something well, to the respective what I'm, bodies. Here's what I believe we're going to do is uh, we will circulate <coughs> the scope and the cost. Um, and unless there is objection, we will administratively proceed with the contract so that the work can proceed. I will say this just as your, as your city manager. A big part of my job is to facilitate the decisions of the public body. That's, my, my, that's how I serve the elected body. On this issue, there's so many years of work. I've got opinions. You all know what my opinions are. I'm not an independent person anymore. And so I think it is in terms of facilitating decisions and putting things on a track. Um, I'm at the end of my rope in terms of being able to serve you well. And so this is a good way to reset and, and get things going in a positive way. I mean, there's, there's a, a great deal of positive potential here. Okay, so do we have a consensus to go forward? And if so, is there anything else to be said tonight? It, it, a little adjourn. Are we adopting? No, thanks. Until there's a second. Um, um, uh, I'm, I'm not in agreement to leave this to the administrators, frankly. I think this body needs to vote on this contract uh, because uh, I, uh, it could be a very open-ended contract, very expensive to tell us what we already know if we're not very careful. So why don't we do this? Why don't we get the information back? You send it out to everyone you know, around this table, mm -hmm. and then people can send you comments back and then we can decide how to proceed at that point. Like, I think it's a little premature to decide we're gonna do one thing or the other before we know what information you're gonna provide to us. And how will we do that? It's just the next step is get the information and then we can decide. It may be that your concerns are assuaged by what you hear, maybe not, but let's deal with that when it comes. I, that makes sense. I guess my, my only question would be, wh when do you think you'll have something? No, we can get it out tomorrow. Wow. Okay. Right, well, we want to make sure it's thorough as well. I mean, I don't know what kind of consideration you've given. <laughs> can, can I ask a, a procedural question? For a joint meeting like this, um, do we need two separate motions or one motion in order to make a decision this evening? We're going to have any motions because we're not, we're not um, really formally making any decisions. Well, I'd like to make a motion, and I'm trying to figure out if I'm making a motion for both bodies or one body. I think you can I only make a motion for, you, for, your, for your own. So I'd like to make a motion that the city council approve the path forward that the city manager has made and allow him to make a decision after we have the information about the process. Second. Okay. Any discussion on the motion on the table? Uh, could you explain? since we're going to be here for a while, apparently. 
<laughs> Not at my behest. My wife is waiting for a ride from the Metro because she was at the ball game tonight, so yeah. you think you're unhappy. Uh, <laughs> so as I understand it, if the motion uh, is approved, we leave it into the hands of the manager to authorize the expenditure of a no, that's not the motion. sum of money I think to, it be, is the motion, to be it? named later, uh, which is underneath some figure which is allowed to do some kind of work which is not quite specifically defined. Is it with a subgroup or a large group? So can you kind of outline in more detail what it is that we apparently are going to vote on? I would like to ask the council member uh, to restate the motion. I have to say, I mean, to me, I think there is a consensus to go forward, but I personally would like some more information before I would authorize the expenditure of taxpayer money. I don't know what the amount is going to be, the duration, the scope, and I view that as an obligation I personally have. And so I have great faith in the city manager's skills, but uh, I want to be on top of public expenditures. So personally, I'd like that information to come to me and then have an opportunity to comment one way or the other before he would proceed on the, the spending of, of new public dollars. I think, Mayor, that's exactly the motion that Council Member offered. I'm not sure that's hey, not how I heard it. Well, can you repeat the motion? Because I, I think, you know, what I heard and what my colleague heard next to me are apparently two different things here. So repeat the motion, if you will. My motion was that the City Council approve the path forward proposed by the City Manager which included circulating the information about the proposed scope of work and that he be authorized to proceed with that if the feedback from the council was positive on the scope of work and the sum of the work was below the administrative limit. I understood it. I'm against that. I mean, I guess I would just say I'm not sure it's needed. I mean, you may want it for another reason, but I don't think it's required to be to do this. In other words, he's already allowed to do things administratively below a threshold without our authorization. Is there, do you feel like it's legally required or you just want to do it for a? I am just suggesting that the council authorize him to do what's legally required because everybody else seems to not want to make a decision. I just think we should be clear about what our decision is. Comments? So if the uh, motion passes, uh, uh, how would you discharge the authority imparted by the motion? Um, I would circulate the information. I'd get any feedback on it if there were uh, objections to it. I would have a conversation with those who have objections to it, see if we can address those objections. Um, if not, um, it, you know, it would not need to be a unanimous. Have everybody approve it. I would then take my own administrative uh, judgment in terms of whether to proceed on the basis that I think there is uh, a general sense of support that uh, a consultant is, is would be helpful. And how would you do it in the absence of a uh, motion of any kind? Uh, pretty much the same thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Comments? Well, uh, yeah, if you move to adjourn, I'll second that. And I, that is a, a motion that trumps all others, I think. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to vote no on the motion because the process you just described is, is the purpose of having a public meeting. I mean, I don't, right. I don't want you doing the conversations with each one of us individually and then sort of getting a, a group think and, and making a decision. I mean, I'm, I'm informed by our consultant who I think will be our consultant who's left uh, that you know in communities there was a certain point at which you know a 5-1 vote was good a 4-3 vote was not good uh, again I mean I'd like to do something here tonight that that creates a process gets us started on a process where we're all together well the normal process is that the staff goes out and gets a consultant and brings it to you and said that hire these people right 
So we had a different process this night where they got, we, A, um, did a small contract to prepare for this meeting so that there was no sense of obligation, so there wasn't a sense that we owed them anything. It, they've been paid for what they did tonight, and so we're free and clear. Um, and now that, but in terms of the decision to proceed, because it is important, I wanted to have, we wanted to have your buy-in for it. We had this initial meeting, uh, and that's really what was uh, the purpose of the way we've done this this time. Normally, we would just bring you the consultant. So, um, look, uh, I'd like to cut through this. I would like you to prepare a scope of work. I'd like you to present it. We can have a discussion. I would like it presented at the first city council meeting so we can vote on it. I'd also like the scope of work from my standpoint to be very clear that we're not paying somebody else to do what we've already collectively done, which has begun, which, sure. is, which is to put together the questions, go through the issues, get get some additional community input. I am interested in a consultant that will take that and then help us put together a way forward. That's what I'm interested in. And I would like to see that in a scope of work. And I'd like to see us formally improve it. It's too important to do that. But I don't think we lose a lot of time if we do it that way. Well, you know, you're adding to the scope that was uh, already discussed. If you want a path forward, that's additional work uh, beyond what I've heard. So, Ms. Gray, yeah, I don't quick, agree with that either. A, a quick body profoundly. point of order. Um, I, I think we are we have availability to do a special meeting uh, probably Friday morning if and as necessary. So, if that's if everybody's good with that and you've got basic do we have time to notice? I, I would say we can do a special meeting. Do we have time to notice? Friday morning. Friday morning. So, I mean, I guess to me we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. I'm not sure. I thought there was a consensus to move forward exactly what you just described. It may not be unanimous, but I thought there was a consensus for you to go ahead and seek some information, put together, or ask others to put together proposals, which include a scope of work, cost, and um, duration, or whatever the relevant terms are for it, and circulate that to these bodies and seek comment. Depending on the comments you receive, that may inform how you proceed. If everyone unanimously was agreement with it, then I think it would be clear you would go forward. If there's substantial concerns or comments raised, then I would, use, I presume, you'd use your good judgment and come to back to us in some fashion or the other, whether that's in a formal meeting or through some other means to try to get a better consensus or work through those issues. That was to my me, understanding. As well. To me, that's a sufficient process to go forward without another meeting or formality of votes or other things. I mean, if other people feel differently, I'm happy to try to work through that. But to me, I thought we'd kind of reached a consensus about 15, 20 minutes ago. Mr. Katsia. Do you have something? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm in violent agreement. Okay. Is, that, is that an agreement on this side of the table, general consensus on this side of the table, or is it I, not? See, I don't necessarily agree. The reason I wanted a motion was because I wanted it to be very clear. And I'm hearing from some people at this table that they don't want to proceed until there's a public hearing in September, delaying the process by a month, half a month, you know, whatever, three weeks, four weeks. Is there any... So, Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yes, I, no, I believe that Mr. Snyder and Mr. Duncan have said that they do not want to make this decision except in a public forum with full information, which will require weeks to gather. So, so we've got two out of seven people who has some reservations about the path that's been suggested tonight. To me, that still doesn't stop the body from acting. You know, in other words, we've tried to work to a full consensus, and we're not sure what it is. It may be that you or I will object to what comes back to us because we don't know what's going to come back to us yet. I'm just willing to go forward and have him gather that information and send it back to us. The next decision point is when the information is provided. And it may be that these folks who don't want to go forward right at this moment may find, you know what, it's a $9,000 contract. I'm happy to go forward. Maybe they won't. It's not an issue of not going forward with all due respect. It's an issue of how we go forward. Okay. Well, so be it. But so what's, what's in the scope of work? What specifically are we asking the consultant to do? Because, I, again, I want to repeat, I don't want to spend money for them to gather information we already have. Okay. Well, fair enough. But I guess the bottom line is how do we proceed? To my mind, gathering the information that we've discussed several times now is the appropriate next step, and then having them come back to us and then have another decision point. Is it that people feel like we need to take some other action, we have some special meeting to discuss it or have a vote on it, or it may be that we're willing to proceed with what you can do administratively without formal action. 
So I guess my suggestion would be to go forward uh, with what we've been discussed this evening. But again, I know everyone doesn't feel that way. Any? I'm, without a vote, I'm happy to proceed as you describe. I, I don't even know what is the administrative limit. Sixty thousand. So we could spend. You could spend without any authorization further. What, what, $60, I will, what I will send to you all tomorrow, will Up be, to. and, and we'll give you all the details, but it will be um, a proposal for a, a three-month engagement at $15,000 a month for a total cost of $45,000. And so that is not just an audit. That is getting you through a decision-making process and getting this process relaunched. Um, it's okay, okay. You know, they, and you, working through. You've given more detail than I even asked for. I mean, yeah. I'm happy with the process that the mayor's outlined without doing it, you know, without, I don't know, it sounds odd, but without doing it without a public vote. Uh, yeah. and, I, and, you know, we say that respectfully. I mean, anytime you hire any consultant, it's a big deal. Uh, uh, we recognize that. So, Mayor, what do we do with the motion on the table? Well, I mean, we do have a motion on the table, and I guess we can vote on it. Um, unless anyone wants to, if you want to proceed with it, then that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a vote on it. Um, but uh, I've sort of made my thoughts uh, known about. So, so let me ask uh, the uh, city attorney that if the motion fails, does that mean that uh, the city manager can then proceed without an approved motion, or or what does it mean exactly? Well, I, I think that I think that you can proceed. I mean, the city manager can proceed because those are actions he could take with or without a vote. Thank you. Okay, any other comments on this on our side of the table? Mr. Mayor? Yes. Would the offer of the motion uh, be willing to withdraw her motion and support the process that the mayor's outlined? If the majority of council would like me to withdraw the motion, I will. I had sort of thought it would be nice to get a decision for once, but, you know, if we don't want to make a decision, I will withdraw my motion, and we can dodge that bullet yet again. I don't think I'll withdraw. Thank you. I don't view this not making a decision. I think it's making a decision without formality that I think makes this a more muddled decision is my view of it. But I thought we were giving a very clear direction to the city manager without the need for a motion. But we can go ahead and take a vote. So I don't know, city manager, do you want to, are you the presider of votes? Uh, no, I, I, I withdrew my motion. I, as I said, it, it is not an essential motion. I just thought it would be nice for this body to make a decision for once. But Thank well, I you, guess Ms. we can Oliver. ask, is everyone comfortable? We'll just go around the table. I think that is a yes. decision. Yes, I, I think you're right. Everyone's comfortable. I move to adjourn. All right. Well, uh, do you guys ready to go, or do you have any other business? We're, unless you guys want to stay. Okay. We'll go. We're good. Okay. Thank you all. All right. We are adjourned. We're adjourned.